The Mystery Knight, A Tale of the Seven Kingdoms A light summer rain was falling as Dunk and Egg took their leave of Stony Sept. Dunk rode his old warhorse Thunder, with Egg beside him on the spirited young palfrey he'd named Rain, leading their mule, Maester. On Maester's back were bundled Dunk's armor and Egg's books, their bedrolls, tent, and clothing, several slabs of hard salt beef, half a flagon of mead, and two skins of water. Egg's old straw hat, wide-brimmed and floppy, kept the rain off the mule's head. The boy had cut holes for Maester's ears. Egg's new straw hat was on his own head. Except for the ear holes, the two hats looked much the same to Dunk. As they neared the town gates, Egg reined up sharply. Up above the gateway, a trader's head had been impaled upon an iron spike. It was fresh from the look of it, the flesh more pink than green, but the carrion crows had already gone to work on it. The dead man's lips and cheeks were torn and ragged. His eyes were two brown holes, weeping slow red tears as raindrops mingled with the crusted blood. The dead man's mouth sagged open, as if to harangue travelers passing through the gate below. Dunk had seen such sights before. Back in King's Landing when I was a boy, I stole a head right off its spike once, he told Egg. Actually, it had been Ferret who scampered up the wall to snatch the head after Rafe and Pudding said he'd never dare. But when the guards came running, he tossed it down, and Dunk was the one who'd caught it. Some rebel lord or robber knight it was. Or maybe just a common murderer. A head's a head. They all looked the same after a few days on a spike. Him and his three friends had used the head to terrorize the girls of Flea Bottom. They'd chase them through the alleys and make them give the head a kiss before they'd let them go. That head got kissed a lot, as he recalled. There wasn't a girl in King's Landing who could run as fast as Rafe. Egg was better off not hearing that part, though. Ferret, Rafe, and Pudding. Little monsters, those three, and me the worst of all. His friends and he had kept the head until the flesh turned black and began to slough away. That took the fun out of chasing girls, so one night they burst into a pot shop and tossed what was left into the kettle. The crows always go for the eyes, he told Egg. Then the cheeks cave in. The flesh turns green. He squinted. Wait. I know that face. You do, sir, said Egg. Three days ago, the hunchbacked Septon we heard preaching against Lord Bloodraven. He remembered then. He was a holy man sworn to the seven, even if he did preach treason. His hands are scarlet with a brother's blood, and the blood of his young nephews, too, the hunchback had declared to the crowd that had gathered in the market square. A shadow came at his command to strangle brave Prince Valar's sons in their mother's womb. Where is our young prince now? Where is his brother, sweet Materis? Where has good King Daron gone and fearless Baylor Breakspear? The grave has claimed them, every one, yet he endures, this pale bird with bloody beak who perches on King Ares' shoulder and caws into his ear. The mark of hell is on his face and in his empty eye, and he has brought us drought and pestilence and murder. Rise up, I say, and remember our true king across the water. Seven gods there are, and seven kingdoms, and the black dragon sired seven sons. Rise up, my lords and ladies, rise up, you brave knights and sturdy yeomen, and cast down blood raven that foul sorcerer, lest your children and your children's children be cursed forevermore. Every word was treason. Even so, it was a shock to see him here with holes where his eyes had been. That's him, I, Dunk said, and another good reason to put this town behind us. He gave Thunder a touch of the spur, and he and Egg rode through the gates of Stony Sept, 
listening to the soft sound of the rain. How many eyes does Lord Bloodraven have? The riddle ran. A thousand eyes and one. Some claimed the king's hand was a student of the dark arts who could change his face, put on the likeness of a one-eyed dog, even turn into a mist. Packs of gaunt gray wolves hunted down his foes, men said, and carrion crows spied for him and whispered secrets in his ear. Most of the tales were only tales, Dunk did not doubt, but no one could doubt that Blood Raven had informers everywhere. He had seen the man once with his own two eyes, back in King's Landing. White as bone were the skin and hair of Brynden Rivers, and his eye, he had only the one, the other having been lost to his half-brother Bittersteel on the red grass field, was red as blood. On cheek and neck he bore the wine-stained birthmark that had given him his name. When the town was well behind them, Dunk cleared his throat and said, Bad business, cutting off the heads of septons. All he did was talk. Words are wind. Some words are wind, sir. Some are treason. Egg was skinny as a stick, all ribs and elbows, but he did have a mouth. Now you sound a proper princeling. Egg took that for an insult, which it was. He might have been a septon, but he was preaching lies, sir. The drought wasn't Lord Bloodraven's fault, nor the Great Spring sickness, either. Might be that's so, but if we start cutting off the heads of all the fools and liars, half the towns in the Seven Kingdoms will be empty. Six days later, the rain was just a memory. Dunk had stripped off his tunic to enjoy the warmth of sunlight on his skin. When a light breeze came up, cool and fresh and fragrant as a maiden's breath, he sighed. Water, he announced. Smell it? The lake can't be far now. All I can smell is Maester, sir. He stinks. Egg gave the mule's lead a savage tug. Maester had stopped to crop at the grass beside the road, as he did from time to time. There's an old inn by the lake shore. Dunk had stopped there once when he was squiring for the old man. Sir Arlen said they brewed a fine brown ale. Might be we could have a taste while we waited for the ferry. Egg gave him a hopeful look. To wash the food down, sir? What food would that be? A slice off the roast, the boy said. A bit of duck? A bowl of stew? Whatever they have, sir. Their last hot meal had been three days ago. Since then, they had been living on windfalls and strips of old salt beef as hard as wood. It would be good to put some real food in our bellies before we started north. That wall's a long way off. We could spend the night as well, suggested Egg. Does my lord want a feather bed? Straw will serve me well enough, sir, said Egg, offended. We have no coin for beds. We have twenty-two pennies, three stars, one stag, and that old chipped garnet, sir. Dunk scratched at his ear. I thought we had two silvers. We did, until you bought the tent. Now we have the one. We won't have any if we start sleeping at inns. You want to share a bed with some peddler and wake up with his fleas? Dunk snorted. Not me. I have my own fleas, and they are not fond of strangers. We'll sleep beneath the stars. The stars are good, Egg allowed, but the ground is hard, Sare, and sometimes it's nice to have a pillow for your head. Pillows are for princes. Egg was as good a squire as a knight could want, but every so often he would get to feeling princely. The lad has dragon blood, never forget. Dunk had beggar's blood himself or so they used to tell him back in Flea Bottom, when they weren't telling him that he was sure to hang. Might be we can afford some ale and a hot supper, but I'm not wasting good coin on a bed. We need to save our pennies for the ferryman. The last time he had crossed the lake, the ferry cost only a few coppers, but that had been six years ago, or maybe seven. Everything had grown more costly since then. Well, said Egg, we could use my boot to get across. 
We could, said Dunk, but we won't. Using the boot was dangerous. Word would spread. Word always spreads. His squire was not bald by chance. Egg had the purple eyes of old Valeria and hair that shone like beaten gold and strands of silver woven together. He might as well wear a three-headed dragon as a brooch as let that hair grow out. These were perilous times in Westeros, and, well, it was best to take no chances. Another word about your bloody boot, and I'll clout you in the ears so hard you'll fly across the lake. I'd sooner swim, sir. Egg swam well, and Dunk did not. The boy turned in the saddle. Sir, someone's coming up the road behind us. Hear the horses? I'm not deaf. Dunk could see their dust as well. A large party, and in haste. Do you think they might be outlaws, sir? Egg raised up in the stirrups, more eager than afraid. The boy was like that. Outlaws would be quieter. Only lords make so much noise. Dunk rattled his sword hilt to loosen the blade in its scabbard. Still, we'll get off the road and let them pass. There are lords and lords. It never hurt to be a little wary. The roads were not so safe as when good King Daron sat the Iron Throne. He and Egg concealed themselves behind a thorn bush. Dunk unslung his shield and slipped it onto his arm. It was an old thing, tall and heavy, kite-shaped, made of pine and rimmed with iron. He had bought it in stony sept to replace the shield the long inch had hacked to splinters when they fought. Dunk had not had time to have it painted with his elm and shooting star, so it still bore the arms of its last owner. A hanged man swinging grim and gray beneath a gallows tree. It was not a sigil that he would have chosen for himself, but the shield had come cheap. The first riders galloped past within moments, two young lordlings mounted on a pair of coursers. The one on the bay wore an open-faced helm of gilded steel with three tall feathered plumes, one white, one red, one gold. Matching plumes adorned his horse's crinet. The black stallion beside him was barbed in blue and gold. His trappings rippled with the wind of his passage as he thundered past. Side by side, the riders streaked on by, whooping and laughing, their long cloaks streaming behind. A third lord followed more sedately at the head of a long column. There were two dozen in the party, grooms and cooks and serving men, all to attend three knights, plus men-at-arms and mounted crossbowmen, and a dozen drays heavy laden with their armor, tents, and provisions. Slung from the lord's saddle was his shield, dark orange and charged with three black castles. Dunk knew those arms, but from where? The lord who bore them was an older man, sour-mouthed and saturnine, with a close-cropped salt-and-pepper beard. He might have been at Ashford Meadow, Dunk thought, or maybe we served at his castle when I was squiring for Ser Arlen. The old hedge knight had done service at so many different keeps and castles through the years that Dunk could not recall the half of them. The lord reined up abruptly, scowling at the thorn bush. You, in the bush, show yourself. Behind him, two crossbowmen slipped quarrels into the notch. The rest continued on their way. Dunk stepped through the tall grass, his shield upon his arm, his right hand resting on the pommel of his longsword. His face was a red-brown mask from the dust the horses had kicked up, and he was naked from the waist up. He looked a scruffy sight, he knew, though it was like to be the size of him that gave the other pause. We want no quarrel, my lord. There's only the two of us, me and my squire. He beckoned Egg forward. Squire, do you claim to be a knight? Dunk did not like the way the man was looking at him. Those eyes could flay a man. It seemed prudent to remove his hand from his sword. I am a hedge knight seeking service. Every robber knight I've ever hanged has said the same. Your device may be prophetic, sir, if, sir, you are. 
a gallows, and a hanged man. These are your arms? No, my lord. I need to have the shield repainted. Why? Did you rob it off a corpse? I bought it for good coin. Three castles, black on orange. Where have I seen those before? I am no robber. The lord's eyes were chips of flint. How did you come by that scar upon your cheek? A cut from a whip? A dagger. Though my face is none of your concern, my lord. I'll be the judge of what is my concern. By then the two younger knights had come trotting back to see what had delayed their party. There you are, Gormy, called the rider on the black, a young man, lean and lithe, with a comely, clean-shaven face and fine features. Black hair fell shining to his collar. His doublet was made of dark blue silk edged in gold satin. Across his chest, an engrailed cross had been embroidered in gold thread, with a golden fiddle in the first and third quarters, a golden sword in the second and the fourth. His eyes caught the deep blue of his doublet and sparkled with amusement. Alan feared you'd fallen from your horse. A palpable excuse, it seems to me. I was about to leave him in my dust. Who are these two brigands? asked the rider on the bay. Egg bristled at the insult. You have no call to name us brigands, my lord. When we saw your dust, we thought you might be outlaws. That's the only reason that we hid. This is Sir Duncan the Tall, and I'm his squire. The lordlings paid no more heed to that than they would have paid the croaking of a frog. I believe that is the largest lout I have ever seen, declared the knight of three feathers. He had a pudgy face beneath a head of curly hair the color of dark honey. Seven feet if he's an inch, I'd wager. What a mighty crash he'll make when he comes tumbling down. Dunk felt color rising to his face. You'd lose your wager, he thought. The last time he had been measured, Egg's brother, Eamon, pronounced him an inch shy of seven feet. Is that your war horse, Sir Giant? said the feathered lordling. I suppose we could butcher it for the meat. Lord Allen oft forgets his courtesies, the black haired knight said. Please forgive his churlish words, Sir. Allen, you will ask Sir Duncan for his pardon. If I must, will you forgive me, Sir? He did not wait for a reply, but turned his bay about and trotted down the road. The other lingered. Are you bound for the wedding, sir? Something in his tone made Dunk want to tug his forelock. He resisted the impulse and said, We're for the ferry, my lord. As are we. But the only lords hereabout are Gormy and that wastrel who just left us, Alan Cockshaw. I am a vagabond hedge knight like yourself. Sir John the Fiddler, I am called. That was the sort of name a hedge knight might choose. But Dunk had never seen any hedge knight garbed or armed or mounted in such splendor. The Knight of the Golden Hedge, he thought. You know my name. My squire is called Egg. Well met, sir. Come ride with us to White Walls and break a few lances to help Lord Butterwell celebrate his new marriage. I'll wager you could give good account of yourself. Dunk had not done any jousting since Ashford Meadow. If I could win a few ransoms, we'd eat well on the ride north, he thought. But the lord with the three castles on his shield said, Sir Duncan needs to be about his journey, as do we. John the Fiddler paid the older man no mind. I would love to cross swords with you, sir. I've tried men of many lands and races, but never won your size. Was your father large as well? I never knew my father, sir. I am sad to hear it. Mine own sire was taken from me too soon. The fiddler turned to the lord of the three castles. We should ask Sir Duncan to join our jolly company. We do not need his sort. Dunk was at a loss for words. Penniless hedge knights were not oft asked to ride with highborn lords. I would have more in common with their servants. Judging from the length of their column, Lord Cockshaw and the fiddler had brought grooms to tend their horses, 
cooks to feed them, squires to clean their armor, guards to defend them. Dunk had egg. His sword? The fiddler laughed. What sword is that? The big sword? Look at the size of him. We want strong men. Young swords are worth more than old names, I've oft heard it said. By fools. You know little and less about this man. He might be a brigand or one of Lord Bloodraven's spies. I am no man's spy, said Dunk, and my lord has no call to speak of me as if I were deaf or dead or down in Dorn. Those flinty eyes considered him. Down in Dorn would be a good place for you, sir. You have my leave to go there. Pay him no mind, the fiddler said. He's a sour old soul. He suspects everyone. Gormy, I have a good feeling about this fellow. Sir Duncan, will you come with us to Whitewalls? My lord, I... How could he share a camp with such as these? Their serving men would raise their pavilions, their grooms would curry their horses, their cooks would serve them each a capon or a joint of beef, whilst Dunk and Egg gnawed on strips of hard salt beef. I couldn't. You see, said the lord of the three castles, he knows his place, and it is not with us. He turned his horse back toward the road. By now, Lord Cogshaw is half a league ahead. I suppose I must chase him down again. The fiddler gave Dunk an apologetic smile. Perchance we'll meet again some day. I hope so. I should love to try my lance on you. Dunk did not know what to say to that. Good fortune in the list, sir he finally managed, but by then Sir John had wheeled about to chase the column. The older lord rode after him. Dunk was glad to see his back. He had not liked his flinty eyes nor Lord Allen's arrogance. The fiddler had been pleasant enough, but there was something odd about him as well. Two fiddles and two swords, a cross in grailed, he said to Egg as they watched the dust of their departure. What house is that? None, sir. I never saw that shield in any roll of arms. Perhaps he is a hedge knight after all. Dunk had devised his own arms at Ashford Meadow when a puppeteer called Tansell Too Tall asked him what he wanted painted on his shield. Was the older lord some kin to House Frey? The Freys bore castles on their shield, and their holdings were not far from here. Egg rolled his eyes. The Frey arms are two blue towers connected by a bridge on a gray field. Those were three castles, black on orange, sir. Did you see a bridge? No. He just does that to annoy me. And next time you roll your eyes at me, I'll clout you on the ear so hard they'll roll back into your head for good. Egg looked chastened. I never meant, never mind, what you meant. Just tell me who he was. Gorman Peak, the Lord of Starpike. That's down in the reach, isn't it? Does he really have three castles? Only on his shield, sir. House Peak did hold three castles once, but two of them were lost. How do you lose two castles? You fight for the Black Dragon, sir. Oh. Dunk felt stupid. That again. For two hundred years, the realm had been ruled by the descendants of Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters, who had made the Seven Kingdoms one and forged the Iron Throne. Their royal banners bore the three-headed dragon of House Targaryen, red on black. Sixteen years ago, a bastard son of King Aegon IV, named Daemon Blackfire, had risen in revolt against his true-born brother. Damon had used the three-headed dragon on his banners, too, but he reversed the colors, as many bastards did. His revolt had ended on the red grass field, where Damon and his twin sons died beneath a rain of Lord Bloodraven's arrows. Those rebels who survived and bent the knee were pardoned, but some lost land, some titles, some gold. All gave hostages to ensure their future loyalty. Three castles, black on orange. I remember now, 
Sir Arlen never liked to talk about the red grass field, but once in his cups he told me how his sister's son had died. He could almost hear the old man's voice again, smell the wine upon his breath. Roger of Pennytree, that was his name. His head was smashed in by a mace wielded by a lord with three castles on his shield. Lord Gorman Peak. The old man never knew his name, or never wanted to. By that time, Lord Peak and John the Fiddler and their party were no more than a plume of red dust in the distance. It was sixteen years ago. The pretender died, and those who followed him were exiled or forgiven. Anyway, it has naught to do with me. For a while they rode along without talking, listening to the plaintive cries of birds. Half a league on, Dunk cleared his throat and said, Butterwell, he said. His lands are near? On the far side of the lake, sir, Lord Butterwell was the master of coin when King Aegon sat the Iron Throne. King Daron made him hand, but not for long. His arms are undy green and white and yellow, sir. Egg loved showing off his heraldry. Is he a friend of your father? Egg made a face. My father never liked him. In the rebellion, Lord Butterwell's second son fought for the pretender and his eldest for the king. That way he was certain to be on the winning side. Lord Butterwell didn't fight for anyone. Some might call that prudent. My father calls it craven. Aye, he would. Prince Makar was a hard man, proud and full of scorn. We have to go by white walls to reach the king's road. Why not fill our bellies? Just the thought was enough to cause his guts to rumble. Might be that one of the wedding guests will need an escort back to his own seat. You said that we were going north. The wall has stood eight thousand years. It will last a while longer. It's a thousand leagues from here to there, and we could do with some more silver in our purse. Dunk was picturing himself atop thunder, riding down that sour-faced old lord with the three castles on his shield. That would be sweet. It was old Sir Arlen's squire who defeated you, I could tell him, when he came to ransom back his arms and armor. The boy who replaced the boy you killed. The old man would like that. You're not thinking of entering the lists, are you, sir? Might be it's time. It's not, sir. Maybe it's time I gave you a good clout in the ear. I'd only need to win two tilts. If I could collect two ransoms and pay out only one, we'd eat like kings for a year. If there was a melee, I might enter that. Dunk's size and strength would serve him better in a melee than in the lists. It's not customary to have a melee at a marriage, sir. It's customary to have a feast, though. We have a long way to go. Why not set out with our bellies full for once? The sun was low in the west by the time they saw the lake, its waters glimmering red and gold, bright as a sheet of beaten copper. When they glimpsed the turrets of the inn above some willows, Dunk donned his sweaty tunic once again and stopped to splash some water on his face. He washed off the dust of the road as best he could and ran wet fingers through his thick mop of sun-streaked hair. There was nothing to be done for his size or the scar that marked his cheek, but he wanted to make himself appear somewhat less the wild robber knight. The inn was bigger than he'd expected, a great gray sprawl of a place, timbered and turreted, half of it built on pilings out over the water. A road of rough-cut planks had been laid down over the muddy lake shore to the ferry landing, but neither the ferry nor the ferryman were in evidence. Across the road stood a stable with a thatched roof. A dry stone wall enclosed the yard, but the gate was open. Within, they found a well and a watering trough. See to the animals, Dunk told Egg, but see that they don't drink too much. I'll ask about some food. He found the innkeeper sweeping off the steps. Are you come for the ferry? The woman asked him. You're too late. The sun's going down and Ned don't like to cross by night unless the moon is full. He'll be back first thing in the morning. 
Do you know how much he asks? Three pennies for each of you and ten for your horses. We have two horses and a mule. It's ten for mules as well. Dunk did the sums in his head and came up with six and thirty, more than he had hoped to spend. Last time I came this way, it was only two pennies and six for horses. Take that up with Ned. It's not to me. If you're looking for a bed, I've none to offer. Lord Shawnee and Lord Costain brought their retinues. I'm full to bursting. Is Lord Peak here as well? He killed Sir Arlen's squire. He was with Lord Cockshaw and John the Fiddler. Ned took them across on his last run. She looked Dunk up and down. Were you part of their company? We met them on the road is all. A good smell was drifting out of the windows of the inn, one that made Dunk's mouth water. We might like some of what you're roasting if it's not too costly. It's wild boar, the woman said, well peppered and served with onions, mushrooms, and mashed neeps. We could do without the neeps. Some slices off the boar and a tankard of your good brown ale would do for us. How much would you ask for that? And maybe we could have a place on your stable floor to bed down for the night? That was a mistake. The stables are for horses. That's why we call them stables. You're big as a horse, I'll grant you, but I see only two legs. She swept her broom at him to shoo him off. I can't be expected to feed all the seven kingdoms. The boar is for my guests. So is my ale. I won't have lords saying that I run short of food or drink before they were surfeit. The lake is full of fish, and you'll find some other rogues camped down by the stumps. Hedge knights, if you believe them. Her tone made it quite clear that she did not. Might be they'd have food to share. It's not to me. Away with you now. I've work to do. The door closed with a solid thump behind her before Dunk could even think to ask where he might find these stumps. He found Egg sitting on the horse trough, soaking his feet in the water and fanning his face with his big floppy hat. Are they roasting pigs, sir? I smell pork. Wild boar, said Dunk in a glum tone. But who wants boar when we have good salt beef? Egg made a face. Can I please eat my boots instead, sir? I'll make a new pair out of the salt beef. It's tougher. No, Dunk said, trying not to smile. You can't eat your boots. One more word and you'll eat my fist, though. Get your feet out of that trough. He found his great helm on the mule and slung it underhand at Egg. Draw some water from the well and soak the beef. Unless you soaked it for a good long time, the salt beef was like to break your teeth. It tasted best when soaked in ale, but water would serve. Don't use the trough, either. I don't care to taste your feet. My feet could only improve the taste, sir, Egg said, wriggling his toes. But he did as he was bid. The hedge knights did not prove hard to find. Egg spied their fire flickering in the woods along the lakeshore, so they made for it, leading the animals behind them. The boy carried Dunk's helm beneath one arm, sloshing with each step he took. By then, the sun was a red memory in the west. Before long, the trees opened up, and they found themselves in what must once have been a weirwood grove. Only a ring of white stumps and a tangle of bone-pale roots remained to show where the trees had stood when the children of the forest ruled in Westeros. Among the weirwood stumps they found two men squatting near a cook fire, passing a skin of wine from hand to hand. Their horses were cropping at the grass beyond the grove, and they had stacked their arms and armor in neat piles. A much younger man sat apart from the other two, his back against a chestnut tree. Well met, sirs, Dunk called out in a cheerful voice. It was never wise to take armed men unawares. I am called Sir Duncan the Tall. The lad is Egg. May we share your fire? A stout man of middling years rose to greet them, garbed in tattered finery. 
flamboyant ginger whiskers framed his face. Well met, Sir Duncan. You are a large one, and most welcome, certainly, as is your lad. Egg, was it? <laughs> what sort of name is that, pray? A short one, sir. Egg knew better than to admit that Egg was short for Aegon, not to men he did not know. Indeed! What happened to your hair? Rootworms, Dunk thought. Tell him it was rootworms, boy. That was the safest story, the tale they told most often, though sometimes Egg took it in his head to play some childish game. I shaved it off, sir. I mean to stay shaven until I earn my spurs. A noble vow. I am Sir Kyle, the cat of Misty Moor. Under yonder chestnut sits Sir Glendon, ah, uh, Ball. And here you have the good Sir Maynard Plum. Egg's ears pricked up at that name. Plum? Are you kin to Lord Viserys Plum, sir? Distantly, confessed Sir Maynard, a tall, thin, stoop-shouldered man with long, straight flaxen hair. Though I doubt that his lordship would admit to it. One might say that he is of the sweet plums, whilst I am of the sour. Plum's cloak was as purple as name, though frayed about the edges and badly dyed. A moonstone brooch big as a hen's egg fastened it at the shoulder. Elsewise, he wore dun-colored rough-spun and stained brown leather. We have salt beef, said Dunk. Sam Maynard has a bag of apples, said Kyle the cat. And I have pickled eggs and onions. Why, together we have the makings of a feast. Be seated, sir. We have a fine choice of stumps for your comfort. We will be here until mid-morning unless I miss my guess. There is only the one fairy, and it is not big enough to take us all. The lords and their tails must cross first. Help me with the horses, Dunk told Egg. Together, the two of them unsaddled Thunder, Rain, and Maester. Only when the animals had been fed and watered and hobbled for the night did Dunk accept the wineskin that Sir Maynard offered him. Even sour wine is better than none, said Kyle the Cat. We'll drink finer vintages at White Walls. Lord Butterwell is said to have the best wines north of the arbor. He was once the king's hand as his father's father was before him, and he is said to be a pious man besides, and very rich. His wealth is all from cows, said Maynard Plum. He ought to take a swollen udder for his arms. These Butterwells have milk running in their veins, and the phrase are no better. This will be a marriage of cattle thieves and toll collectors, one lot of coin clinkers joining with another. When the black dragon rose, this lord of cows sent one son to Damon and one to Daron to make certain there was a butterwell on the winning side. Both perished on the red grass field, and his youngest died in the spring. That's why he's making this new marriage. Unless this new wife gives him a son, butterwell's name will die with him, as it should. Sir Glendon Ball gave his sword another stroke with the whetstone. The warrior hates cravens. The scorn in his voice made Dunk give the youth a closer look. Sir Glendon's clothes were of good cloth, but well-worn and ill-matched, with the look of hand-me-downs. Tufts of dark brown hair stuck out from beneath his iron half-helm. The lad himself was short and chunky, with small, close-set eyes thick shoulders, and muscular arms. His eyebrows were shaggy as two caterpillars after a wet spring, his nose bulbous, his chin pugnacious. And he was young. Sixteen might be. No more than eighteen. Dunk might have taken him for a squire if Sir Kyle had not named him with a Sir. The lad had pimples on his cheeks in place of whiskers. How long have you been a knight? Dunk asked him. Long enough. Half a year when the moon turns. I was knighted by Sir Morgan Dunstable of Tumblers Falls. Two dozen people saw it. But I have been training for knighthood since I was born. I rode before I walked, and knocked a grown man's tooth out of his head before I lost any of my own. 
I mean to make my name at White Walls and claim the dragon's egg. The dragon's egg? Is that the champion's prize, truly? The last dragon had perished half a century ago. Sir Arlen had once seen a clutch of her eggs, though. They were hard as stone, he said, but beautiful to look upon, the old man had told Dunk. How could Lord Butterwell come by a dragon's egg? King Aegon presented the egg to his father's father after guesting for a night in his old castle, said Sir Maynard Plum. Was it a reward for some act of valor? asked Dunk. Sir Kyle chuckled. Some might call it that. Supposedly old Lord Butterwell had three young maiden daughters when his grace came calling. By morning all three had royal bastards in their little bellies. A hot night's work that was. Dunk had heard such talk before. Aegon the Unworthy had bedded half the maidens in the realm and fathered bastards on the lot of them, supposedly. Worse, the old king had legitimized them all upon his deathbed. The base-born ones, born of tavern wenches, whores, and shepherd girls, and the great bastards, whose mothers had been high-born. We'd all be bastard sons of old King Aegon if half these tales were true. And who's to say we're not? Sir Maynard quipped. You ought to come with us to White Walls, Sir Duncan, urged Sir Kyle. Your size is sure to catch some lordling's eye. You might find good service there. I know I shall. Joffrey Caswell will be at this wedding, the Lord of Bitterbridge. When he was three, I made him his first sword. I carved it out of pine to fit his hand. In my greener days, my sword was sworn to his father. Was that one carved from pine as well? Sir Maynard asked. Kyle the cat had the grace to laugh. That sword was good steel, I assure you. I should be glad to ply it once again in the service of the centaur. Sir Duncan, even if you do not choose to tilt, do join us for the wedding feast. There will be singers and musicians, jugglers and tumblers, and a troop of comic dwarfs. Dunk frowned. Egg and I have a long journey before us. We are headed north to Winterfell. Lord Baron Stark is gathering swords to drive the Krakens from his shores for good. Too cold up there for me, said Sir Maynard. If you want to kill Krakens, go west. The Lannisters are building ships to strike back at the Iron Men on their home islands. That's how you put an end to Dagon Greyjoy. Fighting him on land is fruitless. He just slips back to sea. You have to beat him on the water. That had the ring of truth, but the prospect of fighting Iron Men at sea was not one that Dunk relished. He'd had a taste of that on the White Lady, sailing from Dorne to Old Town, when he'd donned his armor to help the crew repel some raiders. The battle had been desperate and bloody, and once he'd almost fallen in the water. That would have been the end of him. The throne should take a lesson from Stark and Lannister, declared Sir Kyle the Cat. At least they fight. What do the Targaryens do? King Ares hides among his books, Prince Rhaegel prances naked through the Red Keep's halls, and Prince Makar broods at Summerhall. Egg was prodding at the fire with a stick to send sparks floating up into the night. Dunk was pleased to see him ignoring the mention of his father's name. Perhaps he's finally learned to hold that tongue of his. Myself, I blame Bloodraven, Sir Kyle went on. He is the king's hand, yet he does nothing, whilst the krakens spread flame and terror up and down the sunset sea. Sir Maynard gave a shrug. His eye is fixed on Tyrosh, where Bittersteel sits in exile, plotting with the sons of Damon Blackfire, so he keeps the king's ships close at hand lest they attempt to cross. Aye, that may well be, Sir Kyle said, but many would welcome the return of Bittersteel. Bloodraven is the root of all our woes, the white worm gnawing at the heart of the realm. Dunk frowned remembering the hunchbacked septon at Stony Sept. Words like that can cost a man his head. Some might say you're talking treason. How can the truth be treason? 
asked Kyle the cat. In King Daeron's day, a man did not have to fear to speak his mind. But now? He made a rude noise. Bloodraven put King Ares on the Iron Throne. But for how long? Ares is weak, and when he dies, it will be bloody war between Lord Rivers and Prince Makar for the crown, the hand against the air. You have forgotten Prince Rhaegel, my friend, Ser Maynard objected in a mild tone. He comes next in line to Ares, not Makar, and his children after him. Rhaegel is feeble-minded. Why, I bear him no ill will, but the man is good as dead and those twins of his as well, though whether they will die of Makar's mace or Bloodraven's spells. Seven save us, Dunk thought as Egg spoke up, shrill and loud. Prince Makar is Prince Rhaegel's brother. He loves him well. He'd never do harm to him or his. Be quiet, boy, Dunk growled at him. These knights want none of your opinions. I can talk if I want. No, said Dunk. You can't. That mouth of yours will get you killed some day, and me as well, most like. That salt beef's soaked long enough, I think. A strip for all our friends, and be quick about it. Egg flushed, and for half a heartbeat, Dunk feared the boy might talk back. Instead, he settled for a sullen look, seething as only a boy of eleven years can seethe. I, Sir, he said, fishing in the bottom of Dunk's helm. His shaven head shone redly in the firelight as he passed out the salt beef. Dunk took his piece and worried at it. The soak had turned the meat from wood to leather, but that was all. He sucked on one corner, tasting the salt and trying not to think about the roast boar at the inn, crackling on its spit and dripping fat. As dusk deepened, flies and stinging midges came swarming off the lake. The flies preferred to plague their horses, but the midges had a taste for man flesh. The only way to keep from being bitten was to sit close to the fire, breathing smoke. Cook or be devoured, Dunk thought glumly. Now there's a beggar's choice. He scratched at his arms and edged closer to the fire. The wineskin soon came round again. The wine was sour and strong. Dunk drank deep and passed along the skin whilst the cat of Misty Moor began to talk of how he had saved the life of the Lord of Bitterbridge during the Blackfire Rebellion. When Lord Armand's banner-bearer fell, I leapt down from my horse with traitors all around us. Sir, said Glendon Ball, who were these traitors? The Blackfire men, I meant. Firelight glimmered off the steel in Sir Glendon's hand. The pockmarks on his face flamed as red as open sores, and his every sinew was wound as tight as a crossbow. My father fought for the Black Dragon. This again, Dunk snorted. Red or black was not a thing you asked a man. It always made for trouble. I am sure Sir Kyle meant no insult to your father. None, Sir Kyle agreed. It's an old tale, the red dragon and the black. No sense for us to fight about it now, lad. We are all brothers of the hedges here. Sir Glendon seemed to weigh the cat's words to see if he was being mocked. Damon Blackfire was no traitor. The old king gave him the sword. He saw the worthiness in Damon, even though he was born bastard. Why else would he put Blackfire into his hand in place of Daron's? He meant for him to have the kingdom, too. Damon was the better man. A hush fell. Dunk could hear the soft crackle of the fire. He could feel midges crawling on the back of his neck. He slapped at them, watching Egg, willing him to be still. I was just a boy when they fought the red grass field, he said, when it seemed that no one else would speak. But I squired for a knight who fought with the red dragon, and later served another who fought for the black. There were brave men on both sides. Brave men, echoed Kyle the cat a bit feebly. Heroes. Glendon Ball turned his shield about so all of them could see the sigil painted there. 
a fireball blazing red and yellow across a night-black field. I come from hero's blood. Your fireball, son, Egg said. That was the first time they saw Sir Glendon smile. Sir Kyle the cat studied the boy closely. How can that be? How old are you? Quentin Ball died before I was born, Sir Glendon finished, but in me he lives again. He slammed his sword back into its scabbard. I'll show you all at White Walls when I claim the dragon's egg. The next day proved the truth of Sir Kyle's prophecy. Ned's ferry was no wise large enough to accommodate all those who wished to cross, so Lords Costain and Shawnee must go first with their tails. That required several trips, each taking more than an hour. There were the mud flats to contend with, horses and wagons to be gotten down the planks, loaded on the boat, and unloaded again across the lake. The two lords slowed matters even further when they got into a shouting match over precedence. Shawnee was the elder, but Costain held himself to be better born. There was naught that Dunk could do but wait and swelter. We could go first if you let me use my boot, Egg said. We could, Dunk answered, but we won't. Lord Costain and Lord Shawnee were here before us. Besides, they're lords. Egg made a face. Rebel lords? Dunk frowned down at him. What do you mean? They were for the Black Dragon. Well, Lord Shawnee was, and Lord Costain's father. Eamon and I used to fight the battle on Maester Meliquin's green table with painted soldiers and little banners. Costain's arms quarter a silver chalice on black with a black rose on gold. That banner was on the left of Damon's host. Shawnee was with bitter steel on the right and almost died of his wounds. Old dead history. They're here now, aren't they? So they bent the knee, and King Dayron gave them pardon. Yes, but... Dunk pinched the boy's lips shut. Hold your tongue. Egg held his tongue. No sooner had the last boatload of Shawnee men pushed off than Lord and Lady Smallwood turned up at the landing with their own tail. So they must needs wait again. The Fellowship of the Hedge had not survived the night, it was plain to see. Sir Glendon kept his own company, prickly and sullen. Kyle the Cat judged that it would be midday before they were allowed to board the ferry, so he detached himself from the others to try to ingratiate himself with Lord Smallwood, with whom he had some slight acquaintance. Sir Maynard spent his time gossiping with the innkeep. Stay well away from that one, Dunk warned Egg. There was something about Plum that troubled him. He could be a robber knight, for all we know. The warning only seemed to make Sir Maynard more interesting to Egg. I never knew a robber knight. Do you think he means to rob the dragon's egg? Lord Butterwell will have the egg well guarded, I'm sure. Dunk scratched the midge bites on his neck. Do you think he might display it at the feast? I'd like to get a look at one. I'd show you mine, Sir, but it's at Summer Hall. Yours? Your dragon's egg? Dunk frowned down at the boy, wondering if this was some jape. Where did it come from? From a dragon, sir. They put it in my cradle. Do you want a clout in the ear? There are no dragons. No, but there are eggs. The last dragon left a clutch of five, and they have more on Dragonstone, old ones from before the dance. My brothers all have them, too. Arion's looks as though it's made of gold and silver, with veins of fire running through it. Mine is white and green, all swirly. Your dragon's egg. They put it in his cradle. Dunk was so used to egg that sometimes he forgot Aegon was a prince. Of course they'd put a dragon egg inside his cradle. Well, see that you don't go mentioning this egg where anyone is like to hear. I'm not stupid, sir. Egg lowered his voice. Some day the dragons will return. My brother Dayron's dreamed of it, and King Ares read it in a prophecy. Maybe it will be my egg that hatches. 
That would be splendid, would it? Dunk had his doubts, not Egg. Eamon and I used to pretend that our eggs would be the ones to hatch. If they did, we could fly through the sky on Dragonback like the first Aegon and his sisters. Aye, and if all the other knights in the realm should die, I'd be the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. If these eggs are so bloody precious, why is Lord Butterwell giving his away? To show the realm how rich he is? I suppose. Dunk scratched his neck again and glanced over at Sir Glendon Ball, who was tightening the cinches on his saddle as he waited for the ferry. That horse will never serve. Sir Glendon's mount was a sway-backed stot, undersized and old. What do you know about his sire? Why did they call him Fireball? For his hot head and red hair. Sir Quentin Ball was the master at arms at the Red Keep. He taught my father and my uncles how to fight. The great bastards, too. King Aegon promised to raise him to the King's Guard, so Fireball made his wife join the Silent Sisters. Only by the time a place came open, King Aegon was dead and King Daeron named Sir William Wilde instead. My father says that it was Fireball as much as Bittersteel who convinced Daemon Blackfire to claim the crown and rescued him when Daeron sent the Kingsguard to arrest him. Later on, Fireball killed Lord Lefford at the gates of Lannisport and sent the Grey Lion running back to hide inside the rock. At the crossing of the Mander, he cut down the sons of Lady Penrose one by one. They say he spared the life of the youngest one as a kindness to his mother. That was chivalrous of him, Dunk had to admit. Did Sir Quentin die upon the red grass field? Before, Sir, Egg replied. An archer put an arrow through his throat as he dismounted by a stream to have a drink. Just some common man, no one knows who. Those common men can be dangerous when they get it in their heads to start slaying lords and heroes. Dunk saw the ferry creeping slowly across the lake. Here it comes. It's slow. Are we going to go to White Wall, sir? Why not? I want to see this dragon's egg. Dunk smiled. If I win the tourney, we'd both have dragon's eggs. Egg gave him a doubtful look. What? Why are you looking at me that way? I could tell you, sir, the boy said solemnly, but I need to learn to hold my tongue. They seated the hedge knights well below the salt, closer to the doors than to the dais. White Walls was almost new as castles went, having been raised a mere forty years ago by the grandsire of its present lord. The small folk hereabouts called it the Milk House, for its walls and keeps and towers were made of finely dressed white stone, quarried in the vale and brought over the mountains at great expense. Inside were floors and pillars of milky white marble veined with gold. The rafters overhead were carved from the bone-pale trunks of weirwoods. Dunk could not begin to imagine what all of that had cost. The hall was not so large as some others he had known, though. At least we were allowed beneath the roof, Dunk thought as he took his place on the bench between Sir Maynard Plum and Kyle the Cat. Though uninvited, the three of them had been welcomed to the feast quick enough. It was ill luck to refuse a knight hospitality on your wedding day. Young Sir Glendon had a harder time, however. Fireball never had a son, Dunk heard Lord Butterwell's steward tell him loudly. The stripling answered heatedly, and the name of Sir Morgan Dunstable was mentioned several times, but the steward had remained adamant. When Sir Glendon touched his sword hilt, a dozen men-at-arms appeared with spears in hand. But for a moment it looked as though there might be bloodshed. It was only the intervention of a big blond knight named Kirby Pym that saved the situation. Dunk was too far away to hear, but he saw Pym clasp an arm around the steward's shoulders and murmur in his ear, laughing. The steward frowned and said something to Sir Glendon that turned the boy's face dark red. He looks as if he's about to cry, Dunk thought, watching. That or kill someone. 
After all of that, the young knight was finally admitted to the castle hall. Poor Egg was not so fortunate. The great hall is for the lords and knights, an under-steward had informed them haughtily when Dunk tried to bring the boy inside. We have set up tables in the inner yard for squires, grooms, and men-at-arms. If you had an inkling who he was, you would seat him on the dais on a cushioned throne. Dunk had not much liked the look of the other squires. A few were lads of Egg's own age, but most were older, seasoned fighters who long ago had made the choice to serve a knight rather than become one. Or did they have a choice? Knighthood required more than chivalry and skill at arms. It required horse and sword and armor, too, and all of that was costly. Watch your tongue, he told Egg before he left him in that company. These are grown men. They won't take kindly to your insolence. Sit and eat and listen. Might be you'll learn some things. For his own part, Dunk was just glad to be out of the hot sun, with a wine cup before him and a chance to fill his belly. Even a hedge knight grows weary of chewing every bite of food for half an hour. Down here below the salt, the fare would be more plain than fancy, but there would be no lack of it. Below the salt was good enough for dunk. But peasant's pride is lordling's shame, the old man used to say. This cannot be my proper place. Sir Glendon Ball told the under-steward hotly. He had donned a clean doublet for the feast, a handsome old garment with gold lace at the cuffs and collar, and the red chevron and white plates of house ball sewn across the chest. Do you know who my father was? A noble knight and mighty lord, I have no doubt, said the under-steward, but the same is true of many here. Please, take your seat. Or take your leave, sir. It's all the same to me. In the end, the boy took his place below the salt with the rest of them, his mouth sullen. The long white hall was filling up as more knights crowded onto the benches. The crowd was larger than Dunk had anticipated, and from the looks of it, some of the guests had come a very long way. He and Egg had not been around so many lords and knights since Ashford Meadow and there was no way to guess who else might turn up next. We should have stayed out in the hedges, sleeping under trees. If I am recognized... When a serving man placed a loaf of black bread on the cloth in front of each of them, Dunk was grateful for the distraction. He sawed the loaf open lengthwise, hollowed out the bottom half for a trencher, and ate the top. It was stale, but compared with his salt beef, it was custard. At least it did not have to be soaked in ale or milk or water to make it soft enough to chew. Sir Duncan, you appear to be attracting a deal of attention, Sir Maynard Plum observed as Lord Veerwell and his party went parading past them toward places of high honor at the top of the hall. Those girls up on the dais cannot seem to take their eyes off you. I'll wager they have never seen a man so big. Even seated, you are half a head taller than any man in the hall. Dunk hunched his shoulders. He was used to being stared at, but that did not mean he liked it. Let them look. That's the old ox down there beneath the dais, Sir Maynard said. They call him a huge man, but seems to me his belly is the biggest thing about him. You're a bloody giant next to him. Indeed, Sir said one of their companions on the bench, a sallow man, saturnine, clad in gray and green. His eyes were small and shrewd, set close together beneath thin, arching brows. A neat black beard framed his mouth to make up for his receding hair. In such a field as these, your size alone should make you one of the most formidable competitors. I had heard the brute of Bracken might be coming said another man farther down the bench. I think not, said the man in green and gray. This is only a bit of jousting to celebrate his lordship's nuptials, a tilt in the yard to mark the tilt between the sheets. Hardly worth the bother for the likes of Otho Bracken. 
Sir Kyle the cat took a drink of wine. I'll wager my lord of Butterwell does not take the field either. He will cheer on his champions from his lord's box in the shade. Then he'll see his champions fall, boasted Sir Glendon Ball, and in the end he'll hand his egg to me. Sir Glendon is the son of Fireball, Sir Kyle explained to the new man. Might we have the honor of your name, Sir? Sir Uthor Underleaf, the son of no one of importance. Underleaf's garments were of good cloth, clean and well cared for, but simply cut. A silver clasp in the shape of a snail fastened his cloak. If your lance is the equal of your tongue, Sir Glendon, you may even give this big fellow here a contest. Sir Glendon glanced at Dunk as the wine was being poured. If we meet, he'll fall. I don't care how big he is. Dunk watched a server fill his wine cup. I am better with a sword than with a lance, he admitted, and even better with a battle axe. Will there be a melee here? His size and strength would stand him in good stead in a melee, and he knew he could give as good as he got. Jousting was another matter. Melee? At a marriage? Sir Kyle sounded shocked. That would be unseemly. Sir Maynard gave a chuckle. A marriage is a melee, as any married man could tell you. Sir Uthor chuckled. There's just the joust, I fear. But besides the dragon's egg, Lord Butterwell has promised thirty golden dragons for the loser of the final tilt, and ten each for the knights defeated in the round before. Ten dragons is not so bad. Ten dragons would buy a palfrey, so Dunk would not need to ride thunder save in battle. Ten dragons would buy a suit of plate for egg, and a proper knight's pavilion sewn with Dunk's tree and falling star. Ten dragons would mean roast goose and ham and pigeon pie. There are ransoms to be had as well for those who win their matches, Sir Uthor said as he hollowed out his trencher, and I have heard it rumored that some men place wagers on the tilts. Lord Butterwell himself is not fond of taking risks, but amongst his guests are some who wager heavily. No sooner had he spoken than Ambrose Butterwell made his entrance to a fanfare of trumpets from the minstrel's gallery. Dunk shoved to his feet with the rest as Butterwell escorted his new bride down a patterned mirish carpet to the dais, arm in arm. The girl was fifteen and freshly flowered, her lord husband fifty and freshly widowed. She was pink and he was gray. Her bride's cloak trailed behind her, done in undie green and white and yellow. It looked so hot and heavy that Dunk wondered how she could bear to wear it. Lord Butterwell looked hot and heavy, too, with his heavy jowls and thinning flaxen hair. The bride's father followed close behind her, hand in hand with his young son. Lord Frey of the Crossing was a lean man, elegant in blue and gray his heir, a chinless boy of four, whose nose was dripping snot. Lords Costain and Risley came next with their lady wives, daughters of Lord Butterwell by his first wife. Frey's daughters followed with their own husbands. Then came Lord Gorman Peak, Lords Smallwood and Shawnee, various lesser lords and landed knights, Amongst them, Dunk glimpsed John the Fiddler and Alan Cockshaw. Lord Alan looked to be in his cups, though the feast had not yet properly begun. By the time all of them had sauntered to the dais, the high table was as crowded as the benches. Lord Butterwell and his bride sat on plump, downy cushions in a double throne of gilded oak. The rest planted themselves in tall chairs with fancifully carved arms. On the wall behind them, Two huge banners hung from the rafters, the twin towers of Frey, blue on gray, and the green and white and yellow undie of the Butterwells. It fell to Lord Frey to lead the toasts. The king, he began simply. Sir Glendon held his wine cup out above the water basin. Dunk clanked his cup against it, 
and against Sir Uthor's and the rest as well. They drank. Lord Butterwell, our gracious host, Frey proclaimed next. May the father grant him long life and many sons. They drank again. Lady Butterwell, the maiden bride, my darling daughter. May the mother make her fertile. Frey gave the girl a smile. I shall want a grandson before the year is out. Twins would suit me even better, so churn the butter well tonight, my sweet. Laughter rang against the rafters, and the guests drank still once more. The wine was rich and red and sweet. Then Lord Frey said, I give you the king's hand, Brynden Rivers. May the crone's lamp light his path to wisdom. He lifted his goblet high and drank, together with Lord Butterwell and his bride and the others on the dais. Below the salt, Sir Glendon turned his cup over to spill its contents to the floor. A sad waste of good wine, said Maynard Plum. I do not drink to kinslayers, said Sir Glendon. Lord Bloodraven is a sorcerer and a bastard. Born bastard, Sir Uthor agreed mildly, but his royal father made him legitimate as he lay dying. He drank deep, as did Sir Maynard and many others in the hall. Near as many lowered their cups or turned them upside down as Ball had done. Dunk's own cup was heavy in his hand. How many eyes does Lord Bloodraven have? The riddle went, a thousand eyes and one. Toast followed toast, some proposed by Lord Frey and some by others. They drank to young Lord Tully, Lord Butterwell's liege lord, who had begged off from the wedding. They drank to the health of Leo Longthorn, Lord of Highgarden, who was rumored to be ailing. They drank to the memory of their gallant dead. I, thought Dunk, remembering, I'll gladly drink to them. Sir John the Fiddler proposed the final toast. To my brave brothers, I know that they are smiling tonight. Dunk had not intended to drink so much with the jousting on the morrow, but the cups were filled anew after every toast, and he found he had a thirst. Never refuse a cup of wine or a horn of ale, Sir Arlen had once told him. It may be a year before you see another. It would have been discourteous not to toast the bride and groom, he told himself, and dangerous not to drink to the king and his hand, with strangers all about. Mercifully, the fiddler's toast was the last. Lord Butterwell rose ponderously to thank them for coming and promise good jousting on the morrow. Let the feast begin. Suckling pig was served at the high table, a peacock roasted in its plumage, a great pike crusted with crushed almonds. Not a bite of that made it down below the salt. Instead of suckling pig, they got salt pork, soaked in almond milk and peppered pleasantly. In place of peacock, they had capons, crisped up nice and brown and stuffed with onions, herbs, mushrooms, and roasted chestnuts. In place of pike, they ate chunks of flaky white cod in a pastry coffin, with some sort of tasty brown sauce that Dunk could not quite place. There was peas porridge besides, buttered turnips, carrots drizzled with honey, and a ripe white cheese that smelled as strong as Bennis of the Brown Shield. Dunk ate well, but all the while wondered what egg was getting in the yard. Just in case, he slipped half a capon into the pocket of his cloak, with some hunks of bread and a little of the smelly cheese. As they ate, pipes and fiddles filled the air with sprightly tunes, and the talk turned to the morrow's jousting. Sir Franklin Frey is well regarded along the Green Fork, said Uthor Underleaf, who seemed to know these local heroes well. That's him upon the dais, the uncle of the bride. Lucas Nayland is down from Hagsmire. He should not be discounted. Nor should Sir Mortimer Boggs of Crackclaw Point. Elsewise, this should be attorney of household knights and village heroes. Kirby Pym and Galty the Green are the best of those, though neither is a match for Lord Butterwell's good son, Black Tom Heddle.
A nasty bit of business, that one. He won the hand of his lordship's eldest daughter by killing three of her other suitors, it's said, and once unhorsed the lord of Casterly Rock. What, young lord Tybalt? asked Sir Maynard. No, the old grey lion, the one who died in the spring. That was how men spoke of those who had perished during the great spring sickness. He died in the spring. Tens of thousands had died in the spring, among them a king and two young princes. Do not slight Sir Buford Bulwer, said Kyle the Cat. The old ox slew forty men upon the red grass field. And every year his count grows higher, said Sir Maynard. Bulwer's day is done. Look at him, past sixty, soft and fat, and his right eye is good as blind. Do not trouble to search the hole for the champion, a voice behind Dunk said. Here I stand, sirs. Feast your eyes. Dunk turned to find Sir John the Fiddler looming over him, a half-smile on his lips. His white silk doublet had dagged sleeves lined with red satin, so long their points drooped down past his knees. A heavy silver chain looped across his chest, studded with huge dark amethysts whose color matched his eyes. The chain is worth as much as everything I own, Dunk thought. The wine had colored Sir Glendon's cheeks and inflamed his pimples. Who are you to make such boasts? They call me John the Fiddler. Are you a musician or a warrior? I can make sweet song with either lance or resined bow as it happens. Every wedding needs a singer, and every tourney needs a mystery knight. May I join you? Butterwell was good enough to place me on the dais, but I prefer the company of my fellow hedge knights to fat pink ladies and old men. The fiddler clapped Dunk upon the shoulder. Be a good fellow and shove over, Sir Duncan. Dunk shoved over. You are too late for food, sir. No matter. I know where Butterwell's kitchens are. There is still some wine, I trust. The fiddler smelled of oranges and limes, with a hint of some strange eastern spice beneath. Nutmeg, perhaps. Dunk could not have said. What did he know of nutmeg? Your boasting is unseemly, Sir Glendon told the fiddler. Truly? Then I must beg for your forgiveness, sir. I would never wish to give offense to any son of Fireball. That took the youth aback. You know who I am? Your father's son, I hope. Look, said Sir Kyle the Cat, the wedding pie! Six kitchen boys were pushing it through the doors upon a wide-wheeled cart. The pie was brown and crusty and immense, and there were noises coming from inside it, squeaks and squawks and thumps. Lord and Lady Butterwell descended from the dais to meet it, sword in hand. When they cut it open, half a hundred birds burst forth to fly around the hall. In other wedding feasts Dunk had attended, the pies had been filled with doves or songbirds, but inside this one were blue jays and skylarks, pigeons and doves, mockingbirds and nightingales, small brown sparrows and a great red parrot. One and twenty sorts of birds, said Sir Kyle. One and twenty sorts of bird droppings, said Sir Maynard. You have no poetry in your heart, sir. You have shit upon your shoulder. This is the proper way to fill a pie, Sir Kyle sniffed, cleaning off his tunic. The pie is meant to be the marriage, and a true marriage has in it many sorts of things. Joy and grief, pain and pleasure... Love and lust and loyalty. So it is fitting that there be birds of many sorts. No man ever truly knows what a new wife will bring him. A cunt, said Plum, or what would be the point? Dunk shoved back from the table. I need a breath of air. It was a piss he needed, truth be told, but in fine company like this it was more courteous to talk of air. Pray excuse me. Hurry back, sir, said the fiddler. There are jugglers yet to come. 
and you do not want to miss the bedding. Outside, the night wind lapped at Dunk like the tongue of some great beast. The hard-packed earth of the yard seemed to move beneath his feet, or it might be that he was swaying. The lists had been erected in the center of the outer yard. A three-tiered wooden viewing stand had been raised beneath the walls, so Lord Butterwell and his high-born guests would be well shaded on their cushioned seats. There were tents at both ends of the lists where the knights could don their armor, with racks of tourney lances standing ready. When the wind lifted the banners for an instant, Dunk could smell the whitewash on the tilting barrier. He set off in search of the inner ward. He had to hunt up Egg and send the boy to the master of the games to enter him in the lists. That was a squire's duty. Whitewalls was strange to him, however, and somehow Dunk got turned around. He found himself outside the kennels where the hounds caught scent of him and began to bark and howl. They want to tear my throat out, he thought, or else they want the cape on in my cloak. He doubled back the way he'd come, past the sept. A woman went running past, breathless with laughter, a bald knight in hard pursuit. The man kept falling until finally the woman had to come back and help him up. I should slip into the sept and ask the seven to make that knight my first opponent, Dunk thought, but that would have been impious. What I really need is a privy, not a prayer. There were some bushes near at hand, beneath a flight of pale stone steps. Those will serve. He groped his way behind them and unlaced his breeches. His bladder had been full to bursting. The piss went on and on. Somewhere above, a door came open. Donk heard footfalls on the steps, the scrape of boots on stone. Beggar's feast you've laid before us. Without bitter steel, bitter steel be buggered, insisted a familiar voice. No bastard can be trusted, not even him. A few victories will bring him over the water fast enough. Lord Peak. Dunk held his breath and his piss. Easier to speak of victories than to win them. This speaker had a deeper voice than Peak, a bass rumble with an angry edge to it. Old Milkblood expected the boy to have it, and so will all the rest. Glib words and charm cannot make up for that. A dragon would. The prince insists the egg will hatch. He dreamed it, just as he once dreamed his brothers dead. A living dragon will win us all the swords that we would want. A dragon is one thing. A dream's another. I promise you, Blood Raven is not off dreaming. We need a warrior, not a dreamer. Is the boy his father's son? Just do your part as promised, and let me concern myself with that. Once we have Butterwell's gold and the swords of House Frey, Heron Hall will follow, then the Brackens. Otho knows he cannot hope to stand. The voices were fading as the speakers moved away. Dunk's piss began to flow again. He gave his cock a shake and laced himself back up. His father's son, he muttered. Who were they speaking of? Fireball's son? By the time he emerged from under the steps, the two lords were well across the yard. He almost shouted after them to make them show their faces, but thought better of it. He was alone and unarmed, and half drunk besides. Maybe more than half. He stood there frowning for a moment, then marched back to the hall. Inside, the last course had been served and the frolics had begun. One of Lord Frey's daughters played Two Hearts That Beat As One on the High Harp, very badly. Some jugglers flung flaming torches at each other for a while, and some tumblers did cartwheels in the air. Lord Frey's nephew began to sing The Bear and the Maiden Fair, while Sir Kirby Pym beat out time upon the table with a wooden spoon. Others joined in until the whole hall was bellowing, A bear, a bear, all black and brown and covered with hair. Lord Caswell passed out at the table with his face in a puddle of wine, and Lady Verwell began to weep, though no one was quite certain as to the cause of her distress. 
All the while the wine kept flowing. The rich arbor reds gave way to local vintages, or so the fiddler said. If truth be told, Dunk could not tell the difference. There was Hippocris as well, and he tried a cup of that. It might be a year before I have another. The other hedge knights, fine fellows all, had begun to talk of women they had known. Dunk found himself wondering where Tansel was tonight. He knew where Lady Rohan was, a bed at Cold Moat Castle, with old Ser Eustace beside her snoring through his mustache, so he tried not to think of her. Do they ever think of me? he wondered. His melancholy ponderings were rudely interrupted when a troop of painted dwarfs came bursting from the belly of a wheeled wooden pig to chase Lord Butterwell's fool about the tables, walloping him with inflated pig's bladders that made rude noises every time a blow was struck. It was the funniest thing Dunk had seen in years, and he laughed with all the rest. Lord Frey's son was so taken by their antics that he joined in, pummeling the wedding guests with a bladder borrowed from a dwarf. The child had the most irritating laugh Dunk had ever heard, a high, shrill hiccup of a laugh that made him want to take the boy over a knee or throw him down a well. If he hits me with that bladder, I may do it. There's the lad who made this marriage, Sir Maynard said as the chinless urchin went screaming past. How so? The fiddler held up an empty wine cup and a passing server filled it. Sir Maynard glanced toward the dais where the bride was feeding cherries to her husband. His lordship will not be the first to butter that biscuit. His bride was deflowered by a scullion at the twins, they say. She would creep down to the kitchens to meet him. Alas, one night that little brother of hers crept down after her. When he saw them making the two-backed beast, he let out a shriek, and cooks and guardsmen came running and found Milady and her pot-boy coupling on the slab of marble where the cook rolls out the dough, both naked as their name-day and flowered up from head to heel. That cannot be true. Dunk thought. Lord Butterwell had broad lands and pots of yellow gold. Why would he wed a girl who'd been soiled by a kitchen scullion and give away his dragon's egg to mark the match? The frays of the crossing were no nobler than the Butterwells. They owned a bridge instead of cows. That was the only difference. Lords, who can ever understand them? Dunk ate some nuts and pondered what he'd overheard whilst pissing. Dunk the drunk, what is it that you think you heard? He had another cup of hippocris, since the first it tasted so good. Then he lay his head down atop his folded arms and closed his eyes, just for a moment, to rest them from the smoke. When he opened them again, half the wedding guests were on their feet and shouting, Bed them! Bed them! They were making such an uproar that they woke Dunk from a pleasant dream involving Tansel Too Tall and the Red Widow. Bed them! Bed them! The calls rang out. Dunk sat up and rubbed his eyes. Sir Franklin Frey had the bride in his arms and was carrying her down the aisle with men and boys swarming all around him. The ladies at the high table had surrounded Lord Butterwell, Lady Verwell had recovered from her grief and was trying to pull his lordship from his chair, while one of his daughters unlaced his boots and some fray woman pulled up his tunic. Butterwell was flailing at them ineffectually and laughing. He was drunk, Dunk saw, and Sir Franklin was a deal drunker. So drunk he almost dropped the bride. Before Dunk quite realized what was happening, John the Fiddler had dragged him to his feet. Here! he cried out. Let the giant carry her. The next thing he knew, he was climbing a tower stair with the bride squirming in his arms. How he kept his feet was beyond him. The girl would not be still, and the men were all around them, making ribald japes about flowering her up and kneading her well whilst they pulled off her clothes. The dwarfs joined in as well. 
They swarmed around Dunk's legs, shouting and laughing and smacking at his calves with their bladders. It was all he could do not to trip over them. Dunk had no notion where Lord Butterwell's bedchamber was to be found, but the other men pushed and prodded him until he got there, by which time the bride was red-faced, giggling, and nearly naked, save for the stocking on her left leg which had somehow survived the climb. Dunk was crimson, too, and not from exertion. His arousal would have been obvious if anyone had been looking, but fortunately all eyes were on the bride. Lady Butterwell looked nothing like Tansell, but having the one squirming half-naked in his arms had started Dunk thinking about the other. Tansell Too Tall, that was her name, but she was not too tall for me. He wondered if he would ever find her again. There had been some nights when he thought he must have dreamed her. No, Lunk, you only dreamed she liked you. Lord Butterwell's bedchamber was large and lavish once he found it. Mirish carpets covered the floors, a hundred scented candles burned in nooks and crannies, and a suit of plate inlaid with gold and gems stood beside the door. It even had its own privy set into a small stone alcove in the outer wall. When Dunk finally plopped the bride onto her marriage bed, a dwarf leapt in beside her and seized one of her breasts for a bit of a fondle. The girl let out a squeal, the men roared with laughter, and Dunk seized the dwarf by his collar and hauled him kicking off Milady. He was carrying the little man across the room to chuck him out the door when he saw the dragon's egg. Lord Butterwell had placed it on a black velvet cushion atop a marble plinth. It was much bigger than a hen's egg, though not so big as he'd imagined. Fine red scales covered its surface, shining bright as jewels by the light of lamps and candles. Dunk dropped the dwarf and picked up the egg, just to feel it for a moment. It was heavier than he'd expected. You could smash a man's head with this and never crack the shell. The scales were smooth beneath his fingers, and the deep, rich red seemed to shimmer as he turned the egg in his hands. Blood and flame, he thought, but there were gold flecks in it as well, and whorls of midnight black. Here you! What do you think you're doing, sir? A knight he did not know was glaring at him, a big man with a coal-black beard and boils, but it was the voice that made him blink a deep voice, thick with anger. It was him, the man with peak, Dunk realized as the man said, Put that down. I'll thank you to keep your greasy fingers off his lordship's treasures, or by the seven you shall wish you had. The other knight was not near so drunk as Dunk, so it seemed wise to do as he said. He put the egg back on its pillow very carefully and wiped his fingers on his sleeve. I meant no harm, sir. Dunk the lunk, thick as a castle wall. Then he shoved past the man with the black beard and out the door. There were noises in the stairwell, glad shouts and girlish laughter. The women were bringing Lord Butterwell to his bride. Dunk had no wish to encounter them, so he went up instead of down and found himself on the tower roof beneath the stars, with the pale castle glimmering in the moonlight all around him. He was feeling dizzy from the wine, so he leaned against a parapet. Am I going to be sick? Why did he go and touch the dragon's egg? He remembered Tansell's puppet show and the wooden dragon that had started all the trouble there at Ashford. The memory made Dunk feel guilty, as it always did. Three good men dead to save a hedge knight's foot. It made no sense and never had. Take a lesson from that, lunk. It is not for the likes of you to mess about with dragons or their eggs. It almost looks as if it's made of snow. Dunk turned. John the Fiddler stood behind him, smiling in his silk and cloth of gold. What's made of snow? The castle. All that white stone in the moonlight. Have you ever been north of the Neck, Sir Duncan? I'm told it snows there even in the summer. Have you ever seen the wall? No, my lord. 
Why is he going on about the wall? That's where we were going, Egg and me, up north to Winterfell. Would that I could join you. You could show me the way. The way? Dunk frowned. It's right up the King's Road. If you stay to the road and keep going north, you can't miss it. The fiddler laughed. I suppose not, though you might be surprised at what some men can miss. He went to the parapet and looked out across the castle. They say those Northmen are savage folk, and their woods are full of wolves. My lord, why did you come up here? Alan was seeking for me, and I did not care to be found. He grows tiresome when he drinks, does Alan? I saw you slip away from that bedchamber of horrors and slipped out after you. I've had too much wine, I grant you, but not enough to face a naked butterwell. He gave Dunk an enigmatic smile. I dreamed of you, Sir Duncan, before I even met you. When I saw you on the road, I knew your face at once. It was as if we were old friends. Dunk had the strangest feeling then, as if he had lived this all before. I dreamed of you, he said. My dreams are not like yours, Sir Duncan. Mine are true. You dreamed of me, he said in a voice made thick by wine. What sort of dream? Why, the fiddler said, I dreamed that you were all in white from head to heel with a long, pale cloak flowing from those broad shoulders. You were a white sword, sir, a sworn brother of the king's guard, the greatest knight in all the seven kingdoms, and you lived for no other purpose but to guard and serve and please your king. He put a hand on Dunk's shoulder. You have dreamed the same dream. I know you have. He had. It was true. The first time the old man let me hold his sword. Every boy dreams of serving in the king's guard. Only seven boys grow up to wear the white cloak, though. Would it please you to be one of them? Me? Dunk shrugged away the lordling's hand, which had begun to knead his shoulder. It might. Or not. The knights of the king's guard served for life and swore to take no wife and hold no lands. I might find Tansel again some day. Why shouldn't I have a wife and sons? It makes no matter what I dream. Only a king can make a king's guard knight. I suppose that means I'll have to take the throne then. I would much rather be teaching you to fiddle. You're drunk and the crow once called the raven black. Wonderfully drunk. Wine makes all things possible, Sir Duncan. You'd look a god in white, I think. But if the color does not suit you, perhaps you would prefer to be a lord. Dunk laughed in his face. No, I'd sooner sprout big blue wings and fly. One's as likely as the other. Now you mock me. A true knight would never mock his king. The fiddler sounded hurt. I hope you will put more faith in what I tell you when you see the dragon hatch. A dragon will hatch? A living dragon? What, here? I dreamed it. This pale white castle? You? A dragon bursting from an egg? I dreamed it all just as I once dreamed of my brothers lying dead. They were twelve and seven, so they laughed at me and died. I am twenty-two now, and I trust my dreams. Dunk was remembering another tourney, remembering how he had walked through the soft spring rains with another princeling. I dreamed of you and a dead dragon, Egg's brother Dayron said to him, a great beast, huge, with wings so large they could cover this meadow. It had fallen on top of you, but you were alive, and the dragon was dead. And so was he, poor Baylor. Dreams were a treacherous ground on which to build. As you say, my lord, he told the fiddler. Pray excuse me. Where are you going, sir? 
to my bed to sleep. I'm drunk as a dog. Be my dog, sir. The night's alive with promise. We can howl together and wake the very gods. What do you want of me? Your sword. I would make you mine own man and raise you high. My dreams do not lie, Sir Duncan. You will have that white cloak, and I must have the dragon's egg. I must. My dreams have made that plain. Perhaps the egg will hatch, or else... Behind them, the door banged open violently. There he is, my lord! A pair of men-at-arms stepped onto the roof. Lord Gorman Peak was just behind them. Gormy! the fiddler drawled. Why, what are you doing in my bedchamber, my lord? It is a roof, sir, and you have had too much wine. Lord Gorman made a sharp gesture and the guards moved forward. Allow us to help you to that bed. You are jousting on the morrow, pray recall. Kirby Pym can prove a dangerous foe. I had hoped to joust with good Sir Duncan here. Peek gave Dunk an unsympathetic look. Later, perhaps. For your first tilt, you have drawn Sir Kirby Pym. Then Pym must fall. So must they all. The mystery knight prevails against all challengers, and wonder dances in his wake. A guardsman took the fiddler by the arm. Sir Duncan, it seems that we must part, he called as they helped him down the steps. Only Lord Gorman remained upon the roof with Dunk. Hedge knight, he growled. Did your mother never teach you not to reach your hand into the dragon's mouth? I never knew my mother, my lord. That would explain it. What did he promise you? A lordship, a white cloak, big blue wings. Here's my promise. Three feet of cold steel through your belly if you speak a word of what just happened. Dunk shook his head to clear his wits. It did not seem to help. He bent double at the waist and retched. Some of the vomit spattered Peak's boots. The Lord cursed. Hedge knights, he exclaimed in disgust. You have no place here. No true knight would be so discourteous as to turn up uninvited. But you creatures of the hedge, we are wanted nowhere and turn up everywhere, my lord. The wine had made Dunk bold, else he would have held his tongue. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Try and remember what I told you, sir. It will go ill for you if you do not. Lord Peak shook the vomit off his boot. Then he was gone. Dunk leaned against the parapet again. He wondered who was madder, Lord Gorman or the Fiddler. By the time he found his way back to the hall, only Maynard Plum remained of his companions. Was there any flour on her teats when you got the small clothes off her? He wanted to know. Dunk shook his head, poured himself another cup of wine, tasted it, and decided that he had drunk enough. Butterwell's stewards had found rooms in the keep for the lords and ladies, and beds in the barracks for their retinues. The rest of the guests had their choice between a straw pallet in the cellar or a spot of ground beneath the western walls to raise their pavilions. The modest sailcloth tent Dunk had acquired in Stony Sept was no pavilion, but it kept the rain and sun off. Some of his neighbors were still awake, the silken walls of their pavilions glowing like colored lanterns in the night. Laughter came from inside a blue pavilion covered with sunflowers, and the sounds of love from one striped in white and purple. Egg had set up their own tent a bit apart from the others. Maester and the two horses were hobbled nearby, and Dunk's arms and armor had been neatly stacked against the castle walls. When he crept into the tent, he found his squire sitting cross-legged by a candle, his head shining as he peered over a book. Reading books by candlelight will make you blind. Reading remained a mystery to Dunk, though the lad had tried to teach him. I need the candlelight to see the words, sir. 
Do you want a clout in the ear? What book is that? Dunk saw bright colors on the page, little painted shields hiding in amongst the letters. A roll of arms, sir. Looking for the fiddler? You won't find him. They don't put hedge knights in those rolls, just lords and champions. I wasn't looking for him. I saw some other sigils in the yard. Lord Sunderland is here, sir. He bears the heads of three pale ladies on undy green and blue. A sister man? Truly? The three sisters were islands in the bite. Dunk had heard Septons say that the isles were sinks of sin and avarice. Sisterton was the most notorious smuggler's den in all of Westeros. He comes a long way. He must be kin to Butterwell's new bride. He isn't, sir. Then he's here for the feast. They eat fish on the three sisters, don't they? A man gets sick of fish. Did you get enough to eat? I brought you half a capon and some cheese. Dunk rummaged in the pocket of his cloak. They fed us ribs, sir. Egg's nose was deep in the book. Lord Sunderland fought for the black dragon, sir. Like old Sir Eustace? He wasn't so bad, was he? No, sir, Egg said, but I saw the dragon's egg. Dunk squirreled the food away with their hard bread and salt beef. It was red, mostly. Does Lord Bloodraven own a dragon's egg as well? Egg lowered his book. Why would he? He's baseborn. Bastard born, not baseborn. Bloodraven had been born on the wrong side of the blanket, but he was noble on both sides. Dunk was about to tell Egg about the men he'd overheard when he noticed his face. What happened to your lip? A fight, sir. Let me see it. It only bled a little. I dabbed some wine on it. Who were you fighting? Some other squires. They said— Never mind what they said. What did I tell you? To hold my tongue and make no trouble. The boy touched his broken lip. They called my father a kinslayer, though. He is, lad, though I do not think he meant it. Dunk had told Egg half a hundred times not to take such words to heart. You know the truth. Let that be enough. They had heard such talk before, in wine sinks and low taverns and around campfires in the woods. The whole realm knew how Prince Makar's mace had felled his brother Baylor Breakspear at Ashford Meadow. Talk of plots was only to be expected. If they knew Prince Makar was your father, they would never have said such things. Behind your back, yes, but never to your face. And what did you tell these other squires instead of holding your tongue? Egg looked abashed. That Prince Baylor's death was just a mishap. Only when I said Prince Makar loved his brother Baylor, Sir Adam's squire said he loved him to death, and Sir Malor's squire said he meant to love his brother Ares the same way. That was when I hit him. I hit him good. I ought to hit you good. A fat ear to go with that fat lip. Your father would do the same if he were here. Do you think Prince Makar needs a little boy to defend him? What did he tell you when he sent you off with me? To serve you faithfully as your squire, and not flinch from any task or hardship. And what else? To obey the king's laws, the rules of chivalry, and you. And what else? To keep my hair shaved or dyed? The boy said with obvious reluctance and tell no man my true name. Dunk nodded. How much wine had this boy drunk? He was drinking barley beer. You see, the barley beer was talking. Words are wind, Egg. Just let them blow on past you. Some words are wind. The boy was nothing if not stubborn. Some words are treason. This is a traitor's tourney, sir. What, all of them? Dunk shook his head. If it was true, that was a long time ago. The Black Dragon's dead, and those who fought with him are fled or pardoned. And it's not true. Lord Butterwell's sons fought on both sides. That makes him half a traitor, sir. 
16 years ago. Dunk's mellow, whiny haze was gone. He felt angry and near sober. Lord Butterwell's steward is the master of the games, a man named Cosgrove. Find him, and enter my name for the lists. No, wait. Hold back my name. With so many lords on hand, one of them might recall Sir Duncan the Tall from Ashford Meadow. Enter me as the Gallows Knight. The small folk loved it when a mystery knight appeared at a tourney. Egg fingered his fat lip. The gallows knight, sir? For the shield. Yes, but... Go do as I said. You have read enough for one night. Dunk pinched the candle out between his thumb and forefinger. The sun rose hot and hard, implacable. Waves of heat rose shimmering off the white stones of the castle. The air smelled of baked earth and torn grass, and no breath of wind stirred the banners that drooped atop the keep and gatehouse, green and white and yellow. Thunder was restless, in a way that Dunk had seldom seen before. The stallion tossed his head from side to side as Egg was tightening his saddle cinch. He even bared his big square teeth at the boy. It is so hot, Dunk thought. Too hot for man or mount. A warhorse does not have a placid disposition even at the best of times. The mother herself would be foul-tempered in this heat. In the center of the yard, the jousters began another run. Sir Harbert rode a golden courser barded in black and decorated with the red and white serpents of House Page. Sir Franklin, a sorrel, whose gray silk trapper bore the twin towers of Frey. When they came together, the red and white lance cracked clean in two, and the blue one exploded into splinters, but neither man lost his seat. A cheer went up from the viewing stand and the guardsmen on the castle walls, but it was short and thin and hollow. It is too hot for cheering. Dunk mopped sweat from his brow. It is too hot for jousting. His head was beating like a drum. Let me win this tilt and one more and I will be content. The knights wheeled their horses about at the end of the lists and tossed down the jagged remains of their lances, the fourth pair they had broken. Three too many. Dunk had put off donning his armor as long as he dared, yet already he could feel his small clothes sticking to his skin beneath his steel. There are worse things than being soaked with sweat, he told himself, remembering the fight on the White Lady when the Iron Men had come swarming over her side. He had been soaked in blood by the time that day was done. Fresh lances in hand, Page and Frey put their spurs into their mounts once again. Clods of cracked dry earth sprayed back from beneath their horses' hooves with every stride. The crack of the lance's breaking made Dunk wince. Too much wine last night, and too much food. He had some vague memory of carrying the bride up the steps, and meeting John the Fiddler and Lord Peak upon a roof. What was I doing on a roof? There had been talk of dragons, he recalled, or dragon's eggs or something, but... A noise broke his reverie, part roar and part moan. Dunk saw the golden horse trotting riderless to the end of the lists, as Sir Harbert Page rolled feebly on the ground. Two more before my turn. The sooner he unhorsed Sir Uthor, the sooner he could take his armor off, have a cool drink, and rest. He should have at least an hour before they called him forth again. Lord Butterwell's portly herald climbed to the top of the viewing stand to summon the next pair of jousters. Sir Argrave the Defiant, he called, a knight of Nunny in service to Lord Butterwell of Whitewalls. Sir Glendon Flowers, the knight of the Pussy Willows, come forth and prove your valor. A gale of laughter rippled through the viewing stands. Sir Argrave was a spare, leathery man a seasoned household knight in dinted gray armor riding an unbarded horse. Dunk had known his sort before. Such men were tough as old roots, 
and knew their business. His foe was young Sir Glendon, mounted on his wretched stot and armored in a heavy mail hauberk and open-faced iron half-helm. On his arm his shield displayed his father's fiery sigil. He needs a breastplate and a proper helm, Dunk thought. A blow to the head or chest could kill him, clad like that. Sir Glendon was plainly furious at his introduction. He wheeled his mount in an angry circle and shouted, I am Glendon Ball, not Glendon Flowers. Mock me at your peril, Herald, I warn you. I have hero's blood. The Herald did not deign to reply, but more laughter greeted the young knight's protest. Why are they laughing at him? Dunk wondered aloud. Is he a bastard, then? Flowers was the surname given to bastards born of noble parents in the Reach. And what was all that about pussy willows? I could find out, sir, said Egg. No, it is none of our concern. Do you have my helm? Sir Argrave and Sir Glendon dipped their lances before Lord and Lady Butterwell. Dunk saw Butterwell lean over and whisper something in his bride's ear. The girl began to giggle. Yes, sir. Egg had donned his floppy hat to shade his eyes and keep the sun off his shaved head. Dunk liked to tease the boy about that hat, but just now he wished he had one like it. Better a straw hat than an iron one beneath this sun. He pushed his hair out of his eyes, eased the great helm down into place with two hands, and fastened it to his gorget. The lining stank of old sweat, and he could feel the weight of all that iron on his neck and shoulders. His head throbbed from last night's wine. Sir, Egg said, it's not too late to withdraw. If you lose thunder and your armor, I would be done as a knight. Why should I lose? Dunk demanded. Sir Argrave and Sir Glendon had ridden to opposite ends of the lists. It is not as if I faced the laughing storm. Is there some knight here like to give me trouble? Almost all of them, sir. I owe you a clout in the ear for that. Sir Uthor is ten years my senior and half my size. Sir Argrave lowered his visor. Sir Glendon did not have a visor to lower. You have not ridden in a tilt since Ashford Meadow, sir. Insolent boy. I've trained. Not so faithfully as he might have, to be sure. When he could, he took his turn riding at Quinton's or Ring's, where such were available. And sometimes he would command Egg to climb a tree and hang a shield or barrel stave beneath a well-placed limb for them to tilt at. You're better with a sword than with a lance, Egg said. With an axe or a mace, there's few to match your strength. There was enough truth in that to annoy Dunk all the more. There is no contest for swords or maces, he pointed out, as Fireball's son and Sir Argrave the Defiant began their charge. Go get my shield. Egg made a face, then went to fetch the shield. Across the yard, Sir Argrave's lance struck Sir Glendon's shield and glanced off, leaving a gouge across the comet. But Ball's coronal found the center of his foe's breastplate with such force that it burst his saddle cinch. Knight and saddle both went tumbling to the dust. Dunk was impressed despite himself. The boy jousts almost as well as he talks. He wondered if that would stop them laughing at him. A trumpet rang loud enough to make Dunk wince. Once more the herald climbed his stand. Sir Joffrey of House Caswell, Lord of Bitterbridge and Defender of the Fords. Sir Kyle, the Cat of Misty Moor, come forth and prove your valor. Sir Kyle's armor was of good quality, but old and worn, with many dints and scratches. The mother has been merciful to me, Sir Duncan, he told Dunk and Egg on his way to the lists. I am sent against Lord Caswell, the very man I came to see. If any man upon the field felt worse than Dunk this morning, it had to be Lord Caswell, who had drunk himself insensible at the feast. 
It's a wonder he can sit a horse after last night, said Dunk. The victory is yours, Sir. Oh, no, Sir Kyle smiled a silken smile. The cat who wants his bowl of cream must know when to purr and when to show his claws, Sir Duncan. If his lordship's lance so much as scrapes against my shield, I shall go tumbling to the earth. Afterwards, when I bring my horse and armor to him, I will compliment his lordship on how much his prowess has grown since I made him his first sword. That will recall me to him, and before this day is out, I shall be a Caswell man again, a knight of Bitterbridge. There is no honor in that, Dunk almost said, but he bit his tongue instead. Sir Kyle would not be the first hedge knight to trade his honor for a warm place by the fire. As you say, he muttered, good fortune to you, or bad if you prefer. Lord Joffrey Caswell was a weedy youth of twenty, though admittedly he looked rather more impressive in his armor than he had last night when he'd been face down in a puddle of wine. A yellow centaur was painted on his shield, pulling on a longbow. The same centaur adorned the white silk trappings of his horse and gleamed atop his helm in yellow gold. A man who has a centaur for his sigil should ride better than that. Dunk did not know how well Sir Kyle wielded a lance, but from the way Lord Caswell sat his horse, it looked as though a loud cough might unseat him. All the cat need do is ride past him very fast. Egg held Thunder's bridle as Dunk swung himself ponderously up into the high, stiff saddle. As he sat there waiting, he could feel the eyes upon him. They are wondering if the big hedge knight is any good. Dunk wondered that himself. He would find out soon enough. The cat of Misty Moor was true to his word. Lord Caswell's lance was wobbling all the way across the field, and Sir Kyle's was ill-aimed. Neither man got his horse up past a trot. All the same, the cat went tumbling when Lord Joffrey's coronal chanced to whack his shoulder. I thought all cats landed gracefully upon their feet, Dunk thought as the hedge knight rolled in the dust. Lord Caswell's lance remained unbroken. As he brought his horse around, he thrust it high into the air repeatedly, as if he'd just unseated Leo Longthorn or the Laughing Storm. The cat pulled off his helm and went chasing down his horse. My shield, Dunk said to Egg. The boy handed it up. He slipped his left arm through the strap and closed his hand around the grip. The weight of the kite shield was reassuring, though its length made it awkward to handle, and seeing the hanged man once again gave him an uneasy feeling. Those are ill-omened arms. He resolved to get the shield repainted as soon as he could. May the warrior grant me a smooth course and a quick victory he prayed, as Butterwell's herald was clambering up the steps once more. Sir Uthor Underleaf, his voice rang out. The Gallows Knight, come forth and prove your valor. Be careful, sir, Egg warned as he handed Dunk a tourney lance, a tapered wooden shaft twelve feet long, ending in a rounded iron coronal in the shape of a closed fist. The other squires say Sir Uthor has a good seat, and he's quick. Quick? Dunk snorted. He has a snail on his shield. How quick can he be? He put his heels into Thunder's flanks and walked the horse slowly forward, his lance upright. One victory, and I am no worse than before. Two will leave us well ahead. Two is not too much to hope for in this company. He had been fortunate in the lots, at least. He could as easily have drawn the old ox or Sir Kirby Pym or some other local hero. Dunk wondered if the master of games was deliberately matching the hedge knights against each other, so no lordling need suffer the ignominy of losing to one in the first round. It does not matter. One foe at a time, that was what the old man always said. Sir Uthor is all that should concern me now. 
They met beneath the viewing stand where Lord and Lady Butterwell sat on their cushions in the shade of the castle walls. Lord Frey was beside them, dandling his snot-nosed son on one knee. A row of serving girls was fanning them, yet Lord Butterwell's damask tunic was stained beneath the arms, and his lady's hair was limp from perspiration. She looked hot, bored, and uncomfortable, but when she saw Dunk, she pushed out her chest in a way that turned him red beneath his helm. He dipped his lance to her and her lord husband. Ser Uthor did the same. Butterwell wished them both a good tilt. His wife stuck out her tongue. It was time. Dunk trotted back to the south end of the lists. Eighty feet away, his opponent was taking up his position as well. His gray stallion was smaller than Thunder, but younger and more spirited. Ser Uthor wore green enamel plate and silvery chain mail. Streamers of green and gray silk flowed from his rounded bassinet, and his green shield bore a silver snail. Good armor and a good horse means a good ransom if I unseat him. A trumpet sounded. Thunder started forward at a slow trot. Dunk swung his lance to the left and brought it down so it angled across the horse's head and the wooden barrier between him and his foe. His shield protected the left side of his body. He crouched forward, legs tightening as Thunder drove down the lists. We are one, man, horse, lance. We are one beast of blood and wood and iron. Ser Uthor was charging hard, clouds of dust kicking up from the hooves of his gray. With forty yards between them, Dunk spurred Thunder to a gallop and aimed the point of his lance squarely at the silver snail. The sullen sun, the dust, the heat, the castle, Lord Butterwell and his bride, the fiddler and Sir Maynard, knights, squires, grooms, small folk, all vanished. Only the foe remained. The spurs again. Thunder broke into a run. The snail was rushing toward them, growing with every stride of the gray's long legs. But ahead came Ser Uthor's lance with its iron fist. My shield is strong. My shield will take the blow. Only the snail matters. Strike the snail and the tilt is mine. When ten yards remained between them, Ser Uthor shifted the point of his lance upward. A crack rang in Dunk's ears as his lance hit. He felt the impact in his arm and shoulder but never saw the blow strike home. Uthor's iron fist took him square between his eyes with all the force of man and horse behind it. Dunk woke upon his back, staring up at the arches of a barrel-vaulted ceiling. For a moment, he did not know where he was or how he had arrived there. Voices echoed in his head and faces drifted past him. Old Ser Arlen, Tansel Tutal, Benis of the Brown Shield, the Red Widow, Baylor Breakspear, Arion the Bright Prince, Mad Sad Lady Vaith. Then all at once the joust came back to him. The heat, the snail, the iron fist coming at his face. He groaned and rolled onto one elbow. The movement set his skull to pounding like some monstrous war drum. Both his eyes seemed to be working, at least, nor could he feel a hole in his head which was all to the good. He was in some cellar, he saw, with casks of wine and ale on every side. At least it is cool here, he thought, and drink is close at hand. The taste of blood was in his mouth. Dunk felt a stab of fear. If he had bitten off his tongue, he would be dumb as well as thick. Good morrow, he croaked just to hear his voice. The words echoed off the ceiling. Dunk tried to push himself onto his feet, but the effort set the cellar spinning. Slowly, slowly, said a quavery voice close at hand. A stooped old man appeared beside the bed clad in robes as gray as his long hair. About his neck was a maester's chain of many metals. His face was aged and lined with deep creases on either side of a great beak of a nose. 
Be still and let me see your eyes. He peered in Dunk's left eye and then the right, holding them open between his thumb and forefinger. My head hurts. The maester snorted. Be grateful it still rests upon your shoulders, Sare. Here, this may help somewhat. Drink. Donk made himself swallow every drop of the foul potion and managed not to spit it out. The tourney, he said, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. Tell me, what's happened? The same foolishness that always happens in these affrays. Men have been knocking each other off horses with sticks. Lord Smallwood's nephew broke his wrist, and Sir Eden Risley's leg was crushed beneath his horse. But no one has been killed thus far. Though I had my fears for you, Sir. Was I unhorsed? His head still felt as though it were stuffed full of wool else he would never have asked such a stupid question. Dunk regretted it the instant the words were out. With a crash that shook the highest ramparts, those who had wagered good coin on you were most distraught, and your squire was beside himself. He would be sitting with you still if I had not chased him off. I need no children underfoot. I reminded him of his duty. Dunk found that he needed reminding himself. What duty? Your mount, Sare, your arms and armor. Yes, Dunk said, remembering. The boy was a good squire. He knew what was required of him. I have lost the old man's sword and the armor that Steely Pate forged for me. Your fiddling friend was also asking after you. He told me you were to have the best of care. I threw him out as well. How long have you been tending me? Dunk flexed the fingers of his sword hand. All of them still seemed to work. Only my head's hurt, and Sir Arlen used to say I never used that anyway. Four hours by the sundial. Four hours was not so bad. He had once heard tale of a knight struck so hard that he slept for forty years and woke to find himself old and withered. Do you know if Ser Uthor won his second tilt? Maybe the snail would win the tourney. It would take some sting from the defeat if Dunk could tell himself that he had lost to the best knight in the field. That one? Indeed he did. Against Ser Adam Frey, cousin to the bride and a promising young Lance. Her ladyship fainted when Ser Adam fell. She had to be helped back to her chambers. Dunk forced himself to his feet, reeling as he rose, but the maester helped to steady him. Where are my clothes? I must go. I have to... I must... If you cannot recall, it cannot be so very urgent. The maester made an irritated motion. I would suggest that you avoid rich foods, strong drink, and further blows between your eyes. But I learned long ago that knights are deaf to sense. Go, go! I have other fools to tend. Outside, Dunk glimpsed a hawk soaring in wide circles through the bright blue sky. He envied him. A few clouds were gathering to the east, dark as Dunk's mood. As he found his way back to the tilting ground, the sun beat down on his head like a hammer on an anvil. The earth seemed to move beneath his feet, or it might just be that he was swaying. He had almost fallen twice climbing the cellar steps. I should have heeded Egg. He made his slow way across the outer ward, around the fringes of the crowd. Out on the field, plump Lord Alan Cockshaw was limping off between two squires, the latest conquest of young Glendon Ball. A third squire held his helm, its three proud feathers broken. Sir John the Fiddler, the herald cried, Sir Franklin of House Frey, a knight of the twins, sworn to the Lord of the Crossing, come forth and prove your valor. 
Dunk could only stand and watch as the fiddler's big black trotted onto the field in a swirl of blue silk and golden swords and fiddles. His breastplate was enameled blue as well, as were his polines, cooter, greaves, and gorget. The ring mail underneath was gilded. Sir Franklin rode a dapple gray with a flowing silver mane to match the gray of his silks and the silver of his armor. On shield and surcoat and horse trappings, he bore the twin towers of Frey. They charged and charged again. Dunk stood watching but saw none of it. Dunk the lunk, thick as a castle wall, he chided himself. He had a snail upon his shield. How could you lose to a man with a snail upon his shield? There was cheering all around him. When Dunk looked up, he saw that Franklin Frey was down. The fiddler had dismounted to help his fallen foe back to his feet. He is one step closer to his dragon's egg, Dunk thought, and where am I? As he approached the postern gate, Dunk came upon the company of dwarfs from last night's feast preparing to take their leave. They were hitching ponies to their wheeled wooden pig and a second wain of more conventional design. There were six of them, he saw, each smaller and more malformed than the last. A few might have been children, but they were all so short that it was hard to tell. In daylight, dressed in horsehide breeches and rough-spun hooded cloaks, they seemed less jolly than they had in Motley. "'Good morrow to you,' Dunk said to be courteous. "'Are you for the road? There's clouds to the east. Could mean rain.' The only answer that he got was a glare from the ugliest dwarf. "'Was he the one I pulled off Lady Butterwell last night?' Up close, the little man smelled like a privy. One whiff was enough to make Dunk hasten his steps. The walk across the milk house seemed to take Dunk as long as it had once taken him and Egg to cross the sands of Dorn. He kept a wall beside him, and from time to time he leaned on it. Every time he turned his head, the world would swim. A drink, he thought. I need a drink of water, or else I'm like to fall. A passing groom told him where to find the nearest well. It was there that he discovered Kyle the cat talking quietly with Maynard Plum. Sir Kyle's shoulders were slumped in dejection, but he looked up at Dunk's approach. Sir Duncan, we heard that you were dead or dying. Dunk rubbed his temples. I only wish I were. I know the feeling well, Sir Kyle sighed. Lord Caswell did not know me. When I told him how I carved his first sword, he stared at me as if I'd lost my wits. He said there was no place at Bitterbridge for knights as feeble as I had shown myself to be. The cat gave a bitter laugh. He took my arms and armor, though, my mount as well. What will I do? Dunk had no answer for him. Even a free rider required a horse to ride. Sell swords must have swords to sell. You will find another horse, Dunk said as he drew the bucket up. The Seven Kingdoms are full of horses. You will find some other lord to arm you. He cupped his hands, filled them with water, drank. Some other lord, I. Do you know of one? I am not so young and strong as you, nor so big. Big men are always in demand. Lord Butterwell likes his knights large, for one. Look at that Tom Heddle. Have you seen him joust? He has overthrown every man he's faced. Fireball's lad has done the same, though. The fiddler as well. Would that he had been the one to unhorse me. He refuses to take ransoms. He wants no more than the dragon's egg, he says. That and the friendship of his fallen foes. The flower of chivalry, that one. Maynard Plum gave a laugh. The fiddle of chivalry, you mean? That boy is fiddling up a storm, and all of us would do well to be gone from here before it breaks. He takes no ransoms, said Dunk. A gallant gesture. Gallant gestures come easy when your purse is fat with gold said Sir Maynard. 
There is a lesson here if you have the sense to take it, Sir Duncan. It is not too late for you to go. Go? Go where? Sir Maynard shrugged. Anywhere. Winterfell, Summer Hall, a shy by the shadow. It makes no matter so long as it's not here. Take your horse and armor and slip out the postern gate. You won't be missed. The snail's got his next tilt to think about, and the rest have eyes only for the jousting. For half a heartbeat, Dunk was tempted. So long as he was armed and horsed, he would remain a knight of sorts. Without them, he was no more than a beggar. A big beggar, but a beggar all the same. But his arms and armor belonged to Ser Uthor now. So did Thunder. Better a beggar than a thief. He had been both in Flea Bottom when he ran with Ferret, Rafe, and Pudding, but the old man had saved him from that life. He knew what Ser Arlen of Pennytree would have said to Plum's suggestions. Ser Arlen being dead, Dunk said it for him. Even a hedge knight has his honor. Would you rather die with honor intact or live with it besmirched? No, spare me, I know what you will say. Take your boy and flee, gallows knight, before your arms become your destiny. Dunk bristled. How would you know my destiny? Have a dream, like John the Fiddler? What do you know of egg? I know that eggs do well to stay out of frying pans, said Plum. White Walls is not a healthy place for the boy. How did you fare in your own tilt, sir? Dunk asked him. Oh, I did not chance the lists. The omens had gone sour. Who do you imagine is going to claim the dragon's egg, pray? Not me, Dunk thought. The seven, no, I don't. Venture a guess, sir. You have two eyes. He thought a moment. The fiddler? Very good. Would you care to explain your reasoning? I just... I have a feeling. So do I said Maynard Plum, a bad feeling for any man or boy unwise enough to stand in our fiddler's way. Egg was brushing Thunder's coat outside their tent, but his eyes were far away. The boy has taken my fall hard. Enough, Dunk called. Any more and Thunder will be as bald as you. Sir? Egg dropped the brush. I knew no stupid snail could kill you, sir. He threw his arms around him. Dunk swiped the boy's floppy straw hat and put it on his own head. The maester said you made off with my armor. Egg snatched back his hat indignantly. I've scoured your mail and polished your greaves, gorget, and breastplate, sir. But your helm is cracked and dinted where Sir Uther's coronal struck. You'll need to have it hammered out by an armorer. Let Ser Uthor have it hammered out. It's his now. No horse, no sword, no armor. Perhaps those dwarfs would let me join their troop. That would be a funny sight. Six dwarfs pummeling a giant with pig bladders. Thunder is his, too. Come. We'll take them to him and wish him well in the rest of his tilts. Now, Ser, aren't you going to ransom Thunder? With what, lad? Pebbles and sheep pellets? I thought about that, sir. If you could borrow... Dunk cut him off. No one will lend me that much coin, Egg. Why should they? What am I but some great oaf who called himself a knight until some snail with a stick near stove his head in? Well, said Egg, you could have rain, sir. I'll go back to riding Maester. We'll go to Summer Hall. You can take service in my father's household. His stables are full of horses. You could have a destrier and a palfrey, too. Egg meant well, but Dunk could not go cringing back to Summer Hall. Not that way, penniless and beaten, seeking service without so much as a sword to offer. Lad, he said, that's good of you. But I want no crumbs from your lord father's table, or from his stables, neither. Might be it's time we parted ways. Dunk could always slink off to join the city watch in Lannisport or Old Town. 
They liked big men for that. I've bumped my bean on every beam in every inn from Lannisport to King's Landing. Might be it's time my size earned me a bit of coin instead of just a lumpy head. But watchmen did not have squires. I've taught you what I could, and that was little enough. You'll do better with a proper master at arms to see to your training, some fierce old knight who knows which end of the lance to hold. I don't want a proper master at arms, Egg said. I want you. What if I used my... No, none of that. I will not hear it. Go gather up my arms. We will present them to Ser Uthor with my compliments. Hard things only grow harder if you put them off. Egg kicked the ground his face as droopy as his big straw hat. I, Sir, as you say. From the outside, Sir Uthor's tent was very plain, a large square box of dun-colored sailcloth staked to the ground with hempen ropes. A silver snail adorned the center pole above a long gray pennon, but that was the only decoration. Wait here, Dunk told Egg. The boy had hold of Thunder's lead. The big brown destrier was laden with Dunk's arms and armor, even to his new old shield. The Gallows Knight. What a dismal mystery knight I proved to be. I won't be long. He ducked his head and stooped to shoulder through the flap. The tent's exterior left him ill-prepared for the comforts he found within. The ground beneath his feet was carpeted in woven mirish rugs, rich with color. An ornate trestle table stood surrounded by camp chairs. The feather bed was covered with soft cushions, and an iron brazier burned perfumed incense. Ser Uthor sat at the table, a pile of gold and silver before him, and a flagon of wine at his elbow, counting coins with his squire, a gawky fellow close in age to dunk. From time to time the snail would bite a coin or set one aside. I see I still have much to teach you, Will, Dunk heard him say. This coin has been clipped, the other shaved. And this one? A gold piece danced across his fingers. Look at the coins before taking them. Here, tell me what you see. The dragon spun through the air. Will tried to catch it, but it bounced off his fingers and fell to the ground. He had to get down on his knees to find it. When he did, he turned it over twice before saying, This one's good, my lord. There's a dragon on the one side and a king on the other. Underleaf glanced toward Dunk. The hanged man. It's good to see you moving about, sir. I feared I'd killed you. Will you do me a kindness and instruct my squire as to the nature of dragons? Will, give Sir Duncan the coin. Dunk had no choice but to take it. He unhorsed me. Must he make me caper for him, too? Frowning, he hefted the coin in his palm, examined both sides, tasted it. Gold, not shaved or clipped. The weight feels right. I'd have taken it, too, my lord. What's wrong with it? The king. Dunk took a closer look. The face on the coin was young, clean-shaved, handsome. King Ares was bearded on his coins, the same as old King Aegon. King Daeron, who'd come between them, had been clean-shaved, but this wasn't him. The coin did not appear worn enough to be from before Aegon the Unworthy. Dunk scowled at the word beneath the head. Six letters. They looked the same as he had seen on other dragons. Daeron, the letters read. But Dunk knew the face of Dayron the Good, and this wasn't him. When he looked again, he saw something odd about the shape of the fourth letter. It wasn't... Damon, he blurted out. It says Damon. There never was any King Damon, though, only the Pretender. Damon Blackfire struck his own coinage during his rebellion. It's gold, though. Will argued. If it's gold, it should be just as good as them other dragons, my lord. The snail clouded him along the side of the head. Cretan? Aye, it's gold. Rebel's gold. Traitor's gold. 
It's treasonous to own such a coin, and twice as treasonous to pass it. I'll need to have this melted down. He hit the man again. Get out of my sight. This good knight and I have matters to discuss. Will wasted no time in scrambling from the tent. Have a seat, Sir Uthor said politely. Will you take wine? Here in his own tent, Underleaf seemed a different man than at the feast. A snail hides in his shell, Dunk remembered. Thank you, no. He flicked the gold coin back to Ser Uthor. Traitor's gold. Blackfire gold. Egg said this was a traitor's tourney, but I would not listen. He owed the boy an apology. Half a cup, Underleaf insisted. You sound in need of it. He filled two cups with wine and handed one to Dunk. Out of his armor he looked more a merchant than a knight. You've come about the forfeit, I assume. Aye. Dunk took the wine. Maybe it would help to stop his head from pounding. I brought my horse and my arms and armor. Take them with my compliments. Sir Uthor smiled. And this is where I tell you that you rode a gallant course. Dunk wondered if gallant was a chivalrous way of saying clumsy. That is good of you to say, but I think you misheard me, Sare. Would it be too bold of me to ask how you came to knighthood, Sare? Sare Arlen of Pennytree found me in Flea Bottom chasing pigs. His old squire had been slain on the red grass field, so he needed someone to tend his mount and clean his mail. He promised he would teach me sword and lance and how to ride a horse if I would come and serve him. So I did. A charming tale. Though if I were you, I would leave out the part about the pigs. Pray, where is your Sir Arlen now? He died. I buried him. I see. Did you take him home to Pennytree? I didn't know where it was. Dunk had never seen the old man's penny tree. Sir Arlen seldom spoke of it, no more than Dunk was wont to speak of Flea Bottom. I buried him on a hillside facing west, so he could see the sun go down. The camp chair creaked alarmingly beneath his weight. Sir Uthor resumed his seat. I have my own armor and a better horse than yours. What do I want with some old dun nag and a sack of dinted plate and rusty mail? Steely Pate made that armor. Dunk said with a touch of anger. Egg has taken good care of it. There's not a spot of rust on my mail, and the steel is good and strong. Strong and heavy, Sir Uthor complained, and too big for any man of normal size. You are uncommon large, Duncan the Tall. As for your horse, he is too old to ride and too stringy to eat. Thunder is not so young as he used to be, Dunk admitted and my armor is large, as you say. You could sell it, though. In Lannisport and King's Landing, there are plenty of smiths who will take it off your hands. For a tenth of what it's worth, perhaps, said Sir Uthor, and only to melt down for the metal. No, it's sweet silver I require, not old iron. The coin of the realm. Now, do you wish to ransom back your arms or no? Dunk turned the wine cup in his hands, frowning. It was solid silver, with a line of golden snails inlaid around the lip. The wine was gold as well, and heady on the tongue. If wishes were fishes, I, I'd pay, gladly. Only, you don't have two stags to lock horns. If you would, would lend my horse and armor back to me, I could pay the ransom later. Once I found the coin. The snail looked amused. Where would you find it, pray? I could take service with some lord, or... It was hard to get the words out. They made him feel a beggar. It might take a few years, but I would pay you, I swear it. On your honor as a knight? Dunk flushed. I could make my mark upon a parchment. A hedge knight's scratch upon a scrap of paper? Sir Uthor rolled his eyes. Good to wipe my arse, no more. 
You are a hedge knight, too. Now you insult me. I ride where I will and serve no man but myself, true. But it has been many a year since I last slept beneath a hedge. I find that inns are far more comfortable. I am attorney, knight, the best that you are ever like to meet. The best? His arrogance made Dunk angry. The laughing storm might not agree, sir, nor Leo Longthorn, nor the brute of Bracken. At Ashford Meadow no one spoke of snails. Why is that, if you are such a famous tourney champion? Have you heard me name myself a champion? That way lies renown. I would sooner have the pox. Thank you, but no. I shall win my next joust, I, but in the final I shall fall. Butterwell has thirty dragons for the knight who comes second. That will suffice for me, along with some goodly ransoms and the proceeds of my wagers. He gestured at the piles of silver stags and golden dragons on the table. You seem a healthy fellow and very large. Size will always impress the fools, though it means little and less in jousting. Will was able to get odds of three to one against me. Lord Shawnee gave five to one, the fool. He picked up a silver stag and set it to spinning with a flick of his long fingers. The old ox will be the next to tumble. Then the knight of the pussy willows, if he survives that long. Sentiment being what it is, I should get fine odds against them both. The commons love their village heroes. Sir Glendon has hero's blood, Dunk blurted out. Oh, I do hope so. Hero's blood should be good for two to one. Whore's blood draws poorer odds. Sir Glendon speaks about his purported sire at every opportunity, but have you noticed that he never makes mention of his mother? For good reason. He was born of a camp follower. Jenny, her name was. Penny Jenny, they called her until the red grass field. The night before the battle, she fucked so many men that thereafter she was known as Redgrass Jenny. Fireball had her before that, I don't doubt, but so did a hundred other men. Our friend Glendon presumes quite a lot, it seems to me. He does not even have red hair. Hero's blood, thought Dunk. He says he is a knight. Oh, that much is true. The boy and his sister grew up in a brothel called the Pussy Willows. After Penny Jenny died, the other whores took care of them and fed the lad the tale his mother had concocted about him being Fireball's seed. An old squire who lived nearby gave the boy his training, such that it was, in trade for ale and cunt. But being a squire, he could not knight the little bastard. Half a year ago, however, a party of knights chanced upon the brothel, and a certain Sir Morgan Dunstable took a drunken fancy to Sir Glendon's sister. As it happens, the sister was still a virgin, and Dunstable did not have the price of her maidenhead. So a bargain was struck. Sir Morgan dubbed her brother a knight right there in the pussy willows in front of twenty witnesses, and afterwards little sister took him upstairs and let him pluck her flower. And there you are. Any knight could make a knight. When he was squiring for Sir Arlen, Dunk had heard tales of other men who'd bought their knighthood with a kindness, or a threat, or a bag of silver coins, but never with a sister's maidenhead. That's just a tale, he heard himself say. That can't be true. I had it from Kirby Pym, who claims that he was there, a witness to the knighting. Sir Uther shrugged. Hero's son, whore's son, or both. When he faces me, the boy will fall. The lots may give you some other foe. Sir Uther arched an eyebrow. Cosgrove is as fond of silver as the next man. I promise you I shall draw the old ox next, then the boy. Would you care to wager on it? I have nothing left to wager. Dunk did not know what distressed him more, learning that the snail was bribing the master of the games to get the pairings he desired, or realizing the man had desired him. He stood. I have said what I came to say. My horse and sword are yours, and all my armor.
The snail steepled his fingers. Perhaps there is another way. You are not entirely without your talents. You fall most splendidly. Sir Uthor's lips glistened when he smiled. I will lend you back your steed and armor, if you enter my service. Service? Dunk did not understand. What sort of service? You have a squire. Do you need to garrison some castle? I might if I had a castle. If truth be told, I prefer a good inn. Castles cost too much to maintain. No, the service I would require of you is that you face me in a few more tourneys. Twenty should suffice. You can do that, surely. You shall have a tenth part of my winnings, and in future I promise to strike that broad chest of yours and not your head. You'd have me travel about with you to be unhorsed? Sir Uthor chuckled pleasantly. You are such a strapping specimen, no one will ever believe that some round-shouldered old man with a snail on his shield could put you down. He rubbed his chin. You need a new device yourself, by the way. That hanged man is grim enough, I grant you, but, well, he's hanging, isn't he? Dead and defeated. Something fiercer is required. A bear's head, mayhaps. A skull. Or three skulls, better still. A babe impaled upon a spear. And you should let your hair grow long and cultivate a beard. The wilder and more unkempt, the better. There are more of these little tourneys than you know. With the odds I'd get, we'd win enough to buy a dragon's egg before... It got about that I was hopeless. I lost my armor, not my honor. You'll have thunder and my arms. No more. Pride ill becomes a beggar, Sair. You could do much worse than ride with me. At the least, I could teach you a thing or two of jousting, about which you are pig ignorant at present. You'd make a fool of me. I did that earlier, and even fools must eat. Dunk wanted to smash that smile off his face. I see why you have a snail on your shield. You are no true knight. Spoken like a true O. Oh. Are you so blind you cannot see your danger? Sir Uthor put his cup aside. Do you know why I struck you where I did, sir? He got to his feet and touched Dunk lightly in the center of his chest. A coronal placed here would have put you on the ground just as quickly. The head is a smaller target. The blow is more difficult to land though more likely to be mortal. I was paid to strike you there. Paid? Dunk backed away from him. What do you mean? Six dragons tendered in advance, four more promised when you died. A paltry sum for a knight's life, be thankful for that. Had more been offered, I might have put the point of my lance through your eye slit. Dunk felt dizzy again. Why would someone pay to have me killed? I've done no harm to any man at White Walls. Surely no one hated him that much but Egg's brother Arion and the Bright Prince was in exile across the narrow sea. Who paid you? A serving man brought the gold at sunrise, not long after the master of the games nailed up the pairings. His face was hooded, and he did not speak his master's name. But why? said Dunk. I did not ask. Sir Uthor filled his cup again. I think you have more enemies than you know, Sir Duncan. How not? There are some who would say you were the cause of all our woes. Dunk felt a cold hand on his heart. Say what you mean. The snail shrugged. I may not have been at Ashford Meadow, but jousting is my bread and salt. I follow tourneys from afar as faithfully as the maesters follow stars. I know how a certain hedge knight became the cause of a trial of seven at Ashford Meadow, resulting in the death of Baylor Breakspear at his brother Makar's hand. Sir Uthor seated himself and stretched his legs out. Prince Baylor was well loved. The bright prince had friends as well. 
friends who will not have forgotten the cause of his exile. Think on my offer, Sare. The snail may leave a trail of slime behind him, but a little slime will do a man no harm, whilst if you dance with dragons, you must expect to burn. The day seemed darker when Dunk stepped from the snail's tent. The clouds in the east had grown bigger and blacker, and the sun was sinking to the west, casting long shadows across the yard. Dunk found the squire Will inspecting Thunder's feet. Where's Egg? he asked of him. The ball boy? How would I know? Run off somewhere. He could not bear to say farewell to Thunder, Dunk decided. He'll be back at the tent with his books. He wasn't, though. The books were there, bundled neatly in a stack beside Egg's bedroll, but of the boy there was no sign. Something was wrong here. Dunk could feel it. It was not like Egg to wander off without his leave. A pair of grizzled men-at-arms were drinking barley beer outside a striped pavilion a few feet away. Well, bugger that once was enough for me, one muttered. The grass was green when the sun come up, I— He broke off when the other man gave him a nudge, and only then took note of Dunk. Sir, have you seen my squire? Egg, he's called. The man scratched at the gray stubble underneath one ear. I remember him. Less hair than me, and a mouth three times his size. Some of the other lads shoved him about a bit, but that was last night. I've not seen him since, sir. Scared him off, said his companion. Dunk gave that one a hard look. If he comes back, tell him to wait for me here. Aye, sir, that we will. Might be he just went to watch the jousts. Dunk headed back toward the tilting grounds. As he passed the stables, he came on Sir Glendon Ball brushing down a pretty sorrel charger. Have you seen Egg? he asked him. He ran past a few moments ago. Sir Glendon pulled a carrot from his pocket and fed it to the sorrel. Do you like my new horse? Lord Costain sent his squire to ransom her, but I told him to save his gold. I mean to keep her for my own. His lordship will not like that. His lordship said that I had no right to put a fireball upon my shield. He told me my device should be a clump of pussy willows. His lordship can go bugger himself. Dunk could not help but smile. He had supped at that same table himself, choking down the same bitter dishes as served up by the likes of the Bright Prince and Sir Stefan Fossaway. He felt a certain kinship with the prickly young knight. For all I know, my mother was a whore as well. How many horses have you won? Sir Glendon shrugged. I lost count. Mortimer Boggs still owes me one. He said he'd rather eat his horse than have some whore's bastard riding her. And he took a hammer to his armor before sending it to me. It's full of holes. I suppose I can still get something for the metal. He sounded more sad than angry. There was a stable by the... the inn where I was raised. I worked there when I was a boy, and when I could, I'd sneak the horses off while their owners were busy. I was always good with horses. Stots, roundsies, palfreys, drays, plow horses, war horses. I rode them all, even a Dornish sand steed. This old man I knew taught me how to make my own lances. I thought if I showed them all how good I was, they'd have no choice but to admit I was my father's son. But they won't. Even now, they just won't. Some never will, Dunk told him. It doesn't matter what you do. Others, though, they're not all the same. I've met some good ones. He thought a moment. When the tourney's done, Egg and I mean to go north take service at Winterfell and fight for the Starks against the Iron Men. You could come with us. The North was a world all its own, Sir Arlen always said. No one up there was like to know the tale of Penny Jenny and the Knight of the Pussy Willows. No one will laugh at you up there. They will know you only by your blade and judge you by your worth, he thought. Sir Glendon gave him a suspicious look. Why would I want to do that? 
Are you telling me I need to run away and hide? No, I just thought, two swords instead of one. The roads are not so safe as they once were. That's true enough, the boy said grudgingly. But my father was once promised a place among the king's guard. I mean to claim the white cloak that he never got to wear. You have as much chance of wearing a white cloak as I do, Dunk almost said. You were born of a camp follower, and I crawled out of the gutters of Flea Bottom. Kings do not heap honor on the likes of you and me. The lad would not have taken kindly to that truth, however. Instead, he said, Strength to your arm, then. He had not gone more than a few feet when Sir Glendon called after him. Sir Duncan, wait! I... I should not have been so sharp. A knight must needs be courteous, my mother used to say. The boy seemed to be struggling for words. Lord Peake came to see me after my last joust. He offered me a place at Starpike. He said there was a storm coming the likes of which Westeros had not seen for a generation, that he would need swords and men to wield them, loyal men who knew how to obey. Dunk could hardly believe it. Gorman Peak had made his scorn for Hedge Knight's plain, both on the road and on the roof, but the offer was a generous one. Peak is a great lord, he said, wary, but, but not a man that I would trust, I think. No, the boy flushed. There was a price. He'd take me into his service, he said, but first I would have to prove my loyalty. He would see that I was paired against his friend the Fiddler next, and he wanted me to swear that I would lose. Dunk believed him. He should have been shocked, he knew, and yet somehow he wasn't. What did you say? I said I might not be able to lose to the Fiddler even if I were trying, that I had already unhorsed much better men than him, that the dragon's egg would be mine before the day was done. Ball smiled feebly. It was not the answer that he wanted. He called me a fool, then, and told me that I had best watch my back. The fiddler had many friends, he said, and I had none. Dunk put a hand upon his shoulder and squeezed. You have one, sir. Two once I find egg. The boy looked him in the eye and nodded. It is good to know there are some true knights still. Dunk got his first good look at Sir Tomard Heddle while searching for egg amongst the crowds about the lists. Heavy set and broad, with a chest like a barrel, Lord Butterwell's good son wore black plate over boiled leather and an ornate helm fashioned in the likeness of some demon, scaled and slavering. His horse was three hands taller than thunder and two stones heavier, a monster of a beast, armed in a coat of ring mail. The weight of all that iron made him slow, so Heddle never got up past a canter when the course was run. But that did not prevent him making short work of Sir Clarence Charlton. As Charlton was borne from the field upon a litter, Heddle removed his demonic helm. His head was broad and bald, his beard black and square. Angry red boils festered on his cheek and neck. Dunk knew that face. Heddle was the knight who'd growled at him in the bedchamber when he touched the dragon's egg, the man with the deep voice that he'd heard talking with Lord Peak. A jumble of words came rushing back to him. Beggar's feast you've laid before us. Is the boy his father's son? Bitter steel. Need the sword. Old Milkblood expects. Is the boy his father's son? I promise you, Blood Raven is not off dreaming. Is the boy his father's son? He stared at the viewing stand, wondering if somehow Egg had contrived to take his rightful place among the notables. There was no sign of the boy, however. Butterwell and Frey were missing, too, though Butterwell's wife was still in her seat looking bored and restive. That's queer, Dunk reflected. This was Butterwell's castle, his wedding, and Frey was father to his bride. These jousts were in their honor. Where would they have gone? 
Ser Uthor Underleaf, the herald boomed. A shadow crept across Dunk's face as the sun was swallowed by a cloud. Ser Theomor of House Bulwer, the old ox, a knight of black crown, come forth and prove your valor. The old ox made a fearsome sight in his blood-red armor, with black bull's horns rising from his helm. He needed the help of a brawny squire to get onto his horse, though, and the way his head was always turning as he rode suggested that Sir Maynard had been right about his eye. Still, the man received a lusty cheer as he took the field. Not so the snail, no doubt just as he preferred. On the first pass, both knights struck glancing blows. On the second, the old ox snapped his lance on Sir Uthor's shield, while the snail's blow missed entirely. The same thing happened on the third pass, and this time Ser Uthor swayed as if about to fall. He is feigning, Dunk realized. He is drawing the contest out to fatten the odds for next time. He had only to glance around to see Will at work, making wagers for his master. Only then did it occur to him that he might have fattened his own purse with a coin or two upon the snail. Dunk the lunk, thick as a castle wall. The old ox fell on fifth pass, knocked sideways by a coronal that slipped deftly off his shield to take him in the chest. His foot tangled in his stirrup as he fell, and he was dragged forty yards across the field before his men could get his horse under control. Again the litter came out to bear him to the maester. A few drops of rain began to fall as Bulwer was carried away and darkened his surcoat where they fell. Dunk watched without expression. He was thinking about Egg. What if this secret enemy of mine has got his hands on him? It made as much sense as anything else. The boy is blameless. If someone has a quarrel with me, it should not be him who answers for it. Sir John the Fiddler was being armed for his next tilt when Dunk found him. No fewer than three squires were attending him, buckling on his armor and seeing to the trappings of his horse, whilst Lord Alan Cockshaw sat nearby drinking watered wine and looking bruised and peevish. When he caught sight of Dunk, Lord Alan sputtered, dribbling wine upon his chest. How is it that you're still walking about? The snail stove your face in. Steely pate made me a good strong helm, my lord, and my head is hard as stone, Sir Arlen used to say. The fiddler laughed. Pay no mind to Sir Allen. Fireball's bastard knocked him off his horse onto that plump little rump of his, so now he has decided that he hates all hedge knights. That wretched, pimpled creature is no son of Quentin Ball insisted Alan Cockshaw. He should never have been allowed to compete. If this were my wedding, I should have had him whipped for his presumption. What maid would marry you, Sir John said, and Ball's presumption is a deal less grating than your pouting. Sir Duncan, are you perchance a friend of Galtry the Green? I must shortly part him from his horse. Dunk did not doubt it. I do not know the man, my lord. Will you take a cup of wine, some bread and olives? Only a word, my lord. You may have all the words you wish. Let us adjourn to my pavilion. The fiddler held the flap for him. Not you, Alan. You could do with a few less olives, if truth be told. Inside, the fiddler turned back to Dunk. I knew Ser Uthor had not killed you. My dreams are never wrong. And the snail must face me soon enough. Once I've unhorsed him, I shall demand your arms and armor back. Your destrier as well, though you deserve a better mount. Will you take one as my gift? I... no, I couldn't do that. The thought made Dunk uncomfortable. I do not mean to be ungrateful, but... If it is the debt that troubles you, put the thought from your mind. I do not need your silver, sir. Only your friendship. How can you be one of my knights without a horse? Sir John drew on his gauntlets of lobstered steel and flexed his fingers. My squire is missing. Ran off with a girl, perhaps? 
eggs too young for girls, my lord. He would never leave me of his own will. Even if I were dying, he would stay until my corpse was cold. His horse is still here, so is our mule. If you like, I could ask my men to look for him. My men. Dunk did not like the sound of that. Attorney for traitors, he thought. You are no hedge knight. No. The fiddler's smile was full of boyish charm. But you knew that from the start. You have been calling me my lord since we met upon the road. Why is that? The way you talk. The way you look. The way you act. Dunk the lunk, thick as a castle wall. Up on the roof last night you said some things. Wine makes me talk too much, but I meant every word. We belong together, you and I. My dreams do not lie. Your dreams don't lie, said Dunk, but you do. John is not your true name, is it? No. The fiddler's eyes sparkled with mischief. He has Egg's eyes. His true name will be revealed soon enough to those who need to know. Lord Gorman Peak had slipped into the pavilion, scowling. Hedge Knight, I warn you. Oh, stop it, Gormy, said the fiddler. Sir Duncan is with us, or will be soon. I told you, I dreamed of him. Outside, a herald's trumpet blew. The fiddler turned his head. They are calling me to the lists. Pray excuse me, Sir Duncan. We can resume our talk after I dispose of Sir Galtry the Green. Strength to your arm, Dunk said. It was only courteous. Lord Gorman remained after Sir John had gone. His dreams will be the death of all of us. What did it take to buy Sir Galtry? Dunk heard himself say. Was silver sufficient or does he require gold? Someone has been talking, I see. Peek seated himself in a camp chair. I have a dozen men outside. I ought to call them in and have them slit your throat, Sir. Why don't you? His grace would take it ill. His grace? Dunk felt as though someone had punched him in the belly. Another black dragon, he thought. Another blackfire rebellion. And soon another red grass field. The grass was not red when the sun came up. Why this wedding? Lord Butterwell wanted a new young wife to warm his bed and Lord Frey had a somewhat soiled daughter. Their nuptials provided a plausible pretext for some like-minded lords to gather. Most of those invited here fought for the Black Dragon once. The rest have reason to resent Bloodraven's rule or nurse grievances and ambitions of their own. Many of us had sons and daughters taken to King's Landing to vouchsafe our future loyalty, but most of the hostages perished in the great spring sickness. Our hands are no longer tied. Our time is come. Ares is weak, a bookish man and no warrior. The commons hardly know him, and what they know they do not like. His lords love him even less. His father was weak as well, that is true, but when his throne was threatened, he had sons to take the field for him. Baylor and Makar the hammer and the anvil. But Baylor Breakspear is no more, and Prince Makar sulks at Summerhall at odds with king and hand. Aye, thought Dunk, and now some fool hedge knight has delivered his favorite son into the hands of his enemies. How better to ensure that the prince never stirs from Summerhall? There is Bloodraven, he said. He is not weak. No. Lord Peak allowed, but no man loves a sorcerer, and kinslayers are accursed in the sight of gods and men. At the first sign of weakness or defeat, Bloodraven's men will melt away like summer snows. And if the dream the prince has dreamed comes true, and a living dragon comes forth here at White Walls, Dunk finished for him. The throne is yours. His, said Lord Gorman Peak. I am but a humble servant. He rose. 
do not attempt to leave the castle, sir. If you do, I will take it as a proof of treachery, and you will answer with your life. We have gone too far to turn back now. The leaden sky was spitting down rain in earnest as John the Fiddler and Sir Galtry the Green took up fresh lances at opposite ends of the lists. Some of the wedding guests were streaming off toward the great hall, huddled under cloaks. Sir Galtry rode a white stallion. A drooping green plume adorned his helm, a matching plume his horse's crinet. His cloak was a patchwork of many squares of fabric, each a different shade of green. Gold inlay made his greaves and gauntlet glitter, and his shield showed nine jade mullets upon a leek green field. Even his beard was dyed green in the fashion of the men of Tyrosh across the narrow sea. Nine times he and the fiddler charged with leveled lances, the green patchwork knight and the young lordling of the golden swords and fiddles, and nine times their lances shattered. By the eighth run, the ground had begun to soften, and the big destriers splashed through pools of rainwater. On the ninth, the fiddler almost lost his seat, but recovered before he fell. Well struck, he called out laughing. You almost had me down, sir. Soon enough, the green knight shouted through the rain. No, I think not. The fiddler tossed his splintered lance away, and a squire handed him a fresh one. The next run was their last. Sir Galtry's lance scraped ineffectually off the fiddler's shield, whilst Sir John's took the green knight squarely in the center of the chest and knocked him from his saddle to land with a great brown splash. In the east, Dunk saw the flash of distant lightning. The viewing stands were emptying out quickly, as small folk and lordlings alike scrambled to get out of the wet. See how they run, murmured Alan Cockshaw as he slid up beside Dunk. A few drops of rain and all the bold lords go squealing for shelter. What will they do when the real storm breaks, I wonder? The real storm. Dunk knew Lord Alan was not talking about the weather. What does this one want? Has he suddenly decided to befriend me? The herald mounted his platform once again. Sir Tomard Heddle, a knight of white walls in service to Lord Butterwell, he shouted as thunder rumbled in the distance. Sir Uthor Underleaf, come forth and prove your valor. Dunk glanced over at Sir Uthor in time to see the snail's smile go sour. This is not the match he paid for. The master of the games had crossed him up. But why? Someone else has taken a hand. Someone Cosgrove esteems more than Uthor Underleaf. Dunk chewed on that for a moment. They do not know that Uthor does not mean to win, he realized all at once. They see him as a threat. So they mean for Black Tom to remove him from the fiddler's path. Heddle himself was part of Peak's conspiracy. He could be relied on to lose when the need arose, which left no one but... And suddenly Lord Peak himself was storming across the muddy field to climb the steps to the herald's platform, his cloak flapping behind him. We are betrayed, he cried. Blood Raven has a spy amongst us. The dragon's egg is stolen. Sir John the Fiddler wheeled his mount around. My egg? How is that possible? Lord Butterwell keeps guards outside his bedchamber night and day. Slain, Lord Peak declared, but one man named his killer before he died. Does he mean to accuse me? Dunk wondered. A dozen men had seen him touch the dragon's egg last night when he'd carried Lady Butterwell to her lord husband's bed. Lord Gorman's finger stabbed down in accusation. There he stands, the whore's son. Seize him. At the far end of the lists, Sir Glendon Ball looked up in confusion. For a moment he did not appear to comprehend what was happening until he saw men rushing at him from all directions. Then the boy moved more quickly than Dunk could have believed. He had his sword half out of its sheath when the first man threw an arm around his throat. 
Ball wrenched free of his grip, but by then two more of them were on him. They slammed into him and dragged him down into the mud. Other men swarmed over them, shouting and kicking. That could be me, Dunk realized. He felt as helpless as he had at Ashford, the day they'd told him he must lose a hand and a foot. Alan Cockshaw pulled him back. Stay out of this if you want to find that squire of yours. Dunk turned on him. What do you mean? I may know where to find the boy. Where? Dunk was in no mood for games. At the far end of the field, Sir Glendon was yanked roughly back onto his feet, pinioned between two men-at-arms in mail and half-helms. He was brown with mud from waist to ankle, and blood and rain washed down his cheeks. Hero's blood, thought Dunk, as Black Tom dismounted before the captive. Where's the egg? Blood dribbled from Ball's mouth. Why would I steal the egg? I was about to win it. I thought Dunk, and that they could not allow. Black Tom slashed Ball across the face with a mailed fist. Search his saddlebags, Lord Peak commanded. We'll find the dragon's egg wrapped up and hidden, I'll wager. Lord Allen lowered his voice. And so they will. Come with me if you want to find your squire. There's no better time than now whilst they're all occupied. He did not wait for a reply. Dunk had to follow. Three long strides brought him abreast of the lordling. If you have done Egg any harm, boys are not to my taste. This way, step lively now. Through an archway, down a set of muddy steps, around a corner, Dunk stalked after him, splashing through puddles as the rain fell around them. They stayed close to the walls, cloaked in shadows, finally stopping in a closed courtyard where the paving stones were smooth and slick. Buildings pressed close on every side. Above were windows, closed and shuttered. In the center of the courtyard was a well, ringed with a low stone wall. A lonely place, Dunk thought. He did not like the feel of it. Old instinct made him reach for his sword hilt before he remembered that the snail had won his sword. As he fumbled at his hip where his scabbard should have hung, he felt the point of a knife poke his lower back. Turn on me and I'll cut your kidney out and give it to Butterwell's cooks to fry up for the feast. The knife pushed in through the back of Dunk's jerkin, insistent. Over to the well. No sudden moves, sir. If he has thrown egg down that well, he will need more than some little toy knife to save him. Dunk walked forward slowly. He could feel the anger growing in his belly. The blade at his back vanished. You may turn and face me now, hedge knight. Dunk turned. My lord, is this about the dragon's egg? No, this is about the dragon. Did you think I would stand by and let you steal him? Sir Allen grimaced. I should have known better than to trust that wretched snail to kill you. I'll have my gold back, every coin. Him? Dunk thought. This plump, pasty-faced, perfumed lordling is my secret enemy? He did not know whether to laugh or weep. Sir Uthor earned his gold. I have a hard head is all. So it seems. Back away. Dunk took a step backwards. Again. Again. Once more. Another step and he was flush against the well. Its stones pressed against his lower back. Sit down on the rim. Not afraid of a little bath, are you? You cannot get much wetter than you are right now. I cannot swim. Dunk rested a hand on the well. The stones were wet. One moved beneath the pressure of his palm. What a shame! Will you jump or must I prick you? Dunk glanced down. He could see the raindrops dimpling the water a good twenty feet below. The walls were covered with a slime of algae. I never did you any harm. And never will. Damon's mine. 
I will command his king's guard. You are not worthy of a white cloak. I never claimed I was. Damon. The name rang in Dunk's head. Not John. Damon, after his father. Dunk the lunk, thick as a castle wall. Damon Blackfire sired seven sons. Two died upon the red grass field, twins. Aegon and Amon. Wretched, witless bullies just like you. When we were little, they took pleasure in tormenting me and Damon both. I wept when Bittersteel carried him off to exile, and again when Lord Peak told me he was coming home. But then he saw you upon the road and forgot that I existed. Cockshaw waved his dagger threateningly. You can go into the water as you are, or you can go in bleeding. Which will it be? Dunk closed his hand around the loose stone. It proved to be less loose than he had hoped. Before he could wrench it free, Sir Allen lunged. Dunk twisted sideways, so the point of the blade sliced through the meat of his shield arm. And then the stone popped free. Dunk fed it to his lordship and felt his teeth crack beneath the blow. The well, is it? He hit the lordling in the mouth again, then dropped the stone seized Cockshaw by the wrist and twisted until a bone snapped and the dagger clattered to the stones. After you, my lord. Sidestepping, Dunk yanked at the lordling's arm and planted a kick in the small of his back. Lord Allen toppled headlong into the well. There was a splash. Well done, sir. Dunk whirled. Through the rain, all he could make out was a hooded shape and a single pale white eye. It was only when the man came forward that the shadowed face beneath the cowl took on the familiar features of Sir Maynard Plum, the pale eye no more than the moonstone brooch that pinned his cloak at the shoulder. Down in the well, Lord Allen was thrashing and splashing and calling for help. Murder! Someone help me! He tried to kill me, Dunk said. That would explain all the blood. Blood? He looked down. His left arm was red from shoulder to elbow, his tunic clinging to his skin. Oh. Dunk did not remember falling, but suddenly he was on the ground with raindrops running down his face. He could hear Lord Allen whimpering from the well, but his splashing had grown feebler. We need to have that arm bound up. Sir Maynard slipped his own arm under Dunk. Up now. I cannot lift you by myself. Use your legs. Dunk used his legs. Lord Allen, he's going to drown. He shan't be missed, least of all by the fiddler. He's not. Dunk gasped, pale with pain. A fiddler. No, he is Damon of House Blackfire, the second of his name, or so he would style himself if ever he achieves the Iron Throne. You would be surprised to know how many lords prefer their kings brave and stupid. Damon is young and dashing and looks good on a horse. The sounds from the well were almost too faint to hear. Shouldn't we throw his lordship down a rope? Save him now to execute him later? I think not. Let him eat the meal that he meant to serve to you. Come, lean on me. Plum guided him across the yard. This close, there was something queer about the cast of Ser Maynard's features. The longer Dunk looked, the less he seemed to see. I did urge you to flee, you will recall. But you esteemed your honor more than your life. An honorable death is well and good. But if the life at stake is not your own, what then? Would your answer be the same, Ser? Whose life? From the well came one last splash. Egg? Do you mean egg? Dunk clutched at Plum's arm. Where is he? With the gods, and you will know why, I think. The pain that twisted inside Dunk just then made him forget his arm. He groaned. He tried to use the boot. So I surmise. He showed the ring to Maester Lothair, who delivered him to Butterwell, who no doubt pissed his breeches at the sight of it and started wondering if he had chose the wrong side, 
and how much Blood Raven knows of this conspiracy? The answer to that last is quite a lot. Plum chuckled. Who are you? A friend, said Maynard Plum, one who has been watching you and wondering at your presence in this nest of adders. Now be quiet until we get you mended. Staying in the shadows, the two of them made their way back to Dunk's small tent. Once inside, Sir Maynard lit a fire, filled a bowl with wine, and set it on the flames to boil. A clean cut, and at least it is not your sword arm, he said, slicing through the sleeve of Dunk's blood-stained tunic. The thrust appears to have missed the bone. Still, we will need to wash it out, or you could lose the arm. It doesn't matter. Dunk's belly was roiling, and he felt as if he might retch at any moment. If Egg is dead, you bear the blame. You should have kept him well away from here. I never said the boy was dead, though. I said that he was with the gods. Do you have clean linen, silk? My tunic. The good one I got in Dorn. What do you mean he's with the gods? In good time. Your arm first. The wine soon began to steam. Sir Maynard found Dunk's good silk tunic, sniffed at it suspiciously, then slid out a dagger and began to cut it up. Dunk swallowed his protest. Ambrose Butterwell has never been what you might call decisive, Sir Maynard said as he wadded up three strips of silk and dropped them in the wine. He had doubts about this plot from the beginning, Doubts that were inflamed when he learned that the boy did not bear the sword. And this morning, his dragon's egg vanished, and with it, the last dregs of his courage. Sir Glendon did not steal the egg, Dunk said. He was in the yard all day, tilting or watching others tilt. Peek will find the egg in his saddlebags all the same. The wine was boiling. Plum drew on a leather glove and said, Try not to scream. Then he pulled a strip of silk out of the boiling wine and began to wash the cut. Dunk did not scream. He gnashed his teeth and bit his tongue and smashed his fist against his thigh hard enough to leave bruises, but he did not scream. Sir Maynard used the rest of his good tunic to make a bandage and tied it tight around his arm. How does that feel? he asked when he was done. Bloody awful. Dunk shivered. Where's Egg? With the gods, I told you. Dunk reached up and wrapped his good hand around Plum's neck. Speak plain. I am sick of hints and winks. Tell me where to find the boy or I will snap your bloody neck, friend or no. The Sept? You would do well to go armed. Sir Maynard smiled. Is that plain enough for you, Dunk? His first stop was Sir Uthor Underleaf's pavilion. When Dunk slipped inside, he found only the squire Will bent over a wash tub scrubbing out his master's small clothes. You again? Sir Uthor is at the feast. What do you want? My sword and shield. Have you brought the ransom? No. Then why would I let you take your arms? I have need of them. That's no good reason. How about... Try to stop me and I'll kill you. Will gaped. They're over there. Dunk paused outside the castle sept. God's grant I am not too late. His sword belt was back in its accustomed place, cinched tight about his waist. He had strapped the gallows shield to his wounded arm, and the weight of it was sending throbs of pain through him with every step. If anyone brushed up against him, he feared that he might scream. He pushed the doors open with his good hand. Within, the sept was dim and hushed, lit only by the candles that twinkled on the altars of the seven. The warrior had the most candles burning, as might be expected during a tourney. Many a knight would have come here to pray for strength and courage before they chanced the lists. The stranger's altar was shrouded in shadow, but with a single candle burning. The mother and the father each had dozens, the smith and maiden somewhat fewer, and beneath the shining lantern of the crone 
knelt Lord Ambrose Butterwell, head bowed, praying silently for wisdom. He was not alone. No sooner had Dunk started for him than two men-at-arms moved to cut him off, faces stern beneath their half-helms. Both wore mail beneath surcoats striped in the green, white, and yellow undie of House Butterwell. Hold, sir, one said. You have no business here. Yes, he does. I warned you he would find me. The voice was Egg's. When Egg stepped out from the shadows beneath the father, his shaven head shining in the candlelight, Dunk almost rushed to the boy to pluck him up with a glad cry and crush him in his arms. Something in Egg's tone made him hesitate. He sounds more angry than afraid, and I have never seen him look so stern. And Butterwell on his knees. Something is queer here. Lord Butterwell pushed himself back to his feet. Even in the dim light of the candles, his flesh looked pale and clammy. Let him pass, he told his guardsmen. When they stepped back, he beckoned Dunk closer. I have done the boy no harm. I knew his father well when I was the king's hand. Prince Makar needs to know none of this was my idea. He will, Dunk promised. What is happening here? Peek. This was all his doing, I swear it by the seven. Lord Butterwell put one hand on the altar. May the gods strike me down if I am false. He told me whom I must invite and who must be excluded, and he brought this boy pretender here. I never wanted to be part of any treason, you must believe me. Tom Heddle now, he urged me on, I will not deny it. My good son married to my eldest daughter. But I will not lie, he was part of this. He is your champion, said Egg. If he was in this, so were you. Be quiet, Dunk wanted to roar. That loose tongue of yours will get us killed. Yet Butterwell seemed to quail. My lord, you do not understand. Heddle commands my garrison. You must have some loyal guardsmen, said Egg. These men here, said Lord Butterwell, a few more. I've been too lax, I will allow, but I have never been a traitor. Frey and I harbored doubts about Lord Peake's pretender since the beginning. He does not bear the sword. If he were his father's son, Bittersteel would have armed him with black fire. And all this talk about a dragon, madness, madness and folly. His lordship dabbed the sweat from his face with his sleeve. And now they have taken the egg. The dragon's egg my grandsire had from the king himself as a reward for leal service. It was there this morning when I woke, and my guards swear no one entered or left the bedchamber. It may be that Lord Peak bought them, I cannot say, but the egg is gone. They must have it, or else... Or else the dragons hatched, thought Dunk. If a living dragon appeared again in Westeros, the lords and small folk alike would flock to whichever prince could lay claim to it. My lord, he said, a word with my... my squire, if you would be so good. As you wish, sir. Lord Butterwell knelt to pray again. Dunk drew Egg aside and went down upon one knee to speak with him face to face. I am going to clout you in the ear so hard your head will turn around backwards and you'll spend the rest of your life looking at where you've been. You should, sir. Egg had the grace to look abashed. I'm sorry. I just meant to send a raven to my father. So I could stay a night. The boy meant well. Dunk glanced over to where Butterwell was praying. What did you do to him? Scared him, sir. Aye, I can see that. He'll have scabs on his knees before the night is done. I didn't know what else to do, sir. The maester brought me to them once he saw my father's ring. Them? Lord Butterwell and Lord Frey, sir. Some guards were there as well. Everyone was upset. Someone stole the dragon's egg. Not you, I hope. Egg shook his head. No, sir. 
I knew I was in trouble when the maester showed Lord Butterwell my ring. I thought about saying that I'd stolen it, but I didn't think he would believe me. Then I remembered this one time I heard my father talking about something Lord Bloodraven said about how it was better to be frightening than frightened. So I told them that my father had sent us here to spy for him, that he was on his way here with an army, that his lordship had best release me and give up this treason or it would mean his head. He smiled a shy smile. It worked better than I thought it would, sir. Dunk wanted to take the boy by the shoulders and shake him until his teeth rattled. This is no game, he might have roared. This is life and death. Did Lord Frey hear all this as well? Yes. He wished Lord Butterwell happiness in his marriage and announced that he was returning to the twins forthwith. That was when his lordship brought us here to pray. Frey could flee, Dunk thought, but Butterwell does not have that option, and soon or later he will begin to wonder why Prince Makar and his army have not turned up. If Lord Peak should learn that you are in the castle... The Sept's outer doors opened with a crash. Dunk turned to see Black Tom Heddle glowering in mail and plate, with rainwater dripping off his sodden cloak to puddle by his feet. A dozen men-at-arms stood with him, armed with spears and axes. Lightning flashed blue and white across the sky behind them, etching sudden shadows across the pale stone floor. A gust of wet wind set all the candles in the sept to dancing. Oh, seven bloody hells, was all that Dunk had time enough to think before Heddle said, There's the boy. Take him. Lord Butterwell had risen to his feet. No, halt! The boy is not to be molested. Tomard, what is the meaning of this? Heddle's face twisted in contempt. Not all of us have milk running in our veins, your lordship. I'll have the boy. You do not understand. Butterwell's voice had turned into a high, thin quaver. We are undone. Lord Frey is gone and others will follow. Prince Makar is coming with an army. All the more reason to take the boy as hostage. No, no, said Butterwell. I want no more part of Lord Peak or his pretender. I will not fight. Black Tom looked coldly at his lord. Craven, he spat. Say what you will. You'll fight or die, my lord. He pointed at Egg. A stag to the first man to draw blood. No, no! Butterwell turned to his own guards. Stop them, do you hear me? I command you, stop them! But all the guards had halted in confusion, at a loss as to whom they should obey. Must I do it myself, then? Black Tom drew his longsword. Dunk did the same. Behind me, Egg! Put up your steel, the both of you, Butterwell screeched. I'll have no bloodshed in the sept. Sir Tomard, this man is the prince's sworn shield. He'll kill you. Only if he falls on me. Black Tom showed his teeth in a hard grin. I saw him try to joust. I am better with a sword, Dunk warned him. Heddle answered with a snort and charged. Dunk shoved Egg roughly backwards and turned to meet his blade. He blocked the first cut well enough, but the jolt of Black Tom's sword biting into his shield and the bandaged cut behind it sent a jolt of pain crackling up his arm. He tried a slash at Heddle's head in answer, but Black Tom slid away from it and hacked at him again. Dunk barely got his shield around in time. Pine chips flew and Heddle laughed, pressing his attack low and high and low again. Dunk took each cut with his shield, but every blow was agony, and he found himself giving ground. Get him, sir! He heard Egg call. Get him! Get him! He's right there! The taste of blood was in Dunk's mouth, and worse, his wound had opened once again. A wave of dizziness washed over him. Black Tom's blade was turning the long kite shield to splinters, Oak and iron guard me well, or else I'm dead and doomed to hell, Dunk thought, before he remembered that this shield was made of pine. 
When his back came up hard against an altar, he stumbled to one knee and realized he had no more ground left to give. You are no knight, said Black Tom. Are those tears in your eyes, Oaf? Tears of pain? Dunk pushed up off his knee and slammed shield first into his foe. Black Tom stumbled backwards, yet somehow kept his balance. Dunk bowled right after him, smashing him with the shield again and again, using his size and strength to knock Heddle halfway across the sept. Then he swung the shield aside and slashed out with his longsword, and Heddle screamed as the steel bit through wool and muscle deep into his thigh. His own sword swung wildly, but the blow was desperate and clumsy. Dunk let his shield take it one more time and put all his weight into his answer. Black Tom reeled back a step and stared down in horror at his forearm flopping on the floor beneath the stranger's altar. You, he gasped, you, you. I told you, Dunk stabbed him through the throat. I'm better with a sword. Two of the men-at-arms fled back into the rain as a pool of blood spread out from Black Tom's body. The others clutched their spears and hesitated, casting wary glances toward Dunk as they waited for their lord to speak. This... this was ill done, Butterwell finally managed. He turned to Dunk and Egg. We must be gone from White Walls before those two bring word of this to Gorman Peak. He has more friends amongst the guests than I do. The postern gate in the north wall. We'll slip out there. Come, we must make haste. Dunk slammed his sword into its scabbard. Egg, go with Lord Butterwell. He put an arm around the boy and lowered his voice. Don't stay with him any longer than you need to. Give Rain his head and get away before his lordship changes sides again. Make for Maidenpool. It's closer than King's Landing. What about you, sir? Never mind about me. I'm your squire. I said Dunk, and you'll do as I tell you, or you'll get a good clout in the ear. A group of men were leaving the great hall, pausing long enough to pull up their hoods before venturing out into the rain. The old ox was amongst them, and weedy Lord Caswell once more in his cups. Both gave Dunk a wide berth. Sir Mortimer Boggs favored him with a curious stare, but thought better of speaking to him. Uthor Underleaf was not so shy. You come late to the feast, sir, he said as he was pulling on his gloves, and I see you wear a sword again. You'll have your ransom for it if that's all that concerns you. Dunk had left his battered shield behind and draped his cloak across his wounded arm to hide the blood. Unless I die, then you have my leave to loot my corpse. Sir Uthor laughed. Is that gallantry I smell, or just stupidity? The two scents are much alike, as I recall. It is not too late to accept my offer, sir. It is later than you think, Dunk warned him. He did not wait for Underleaf to answer, but pushed past him through the double doors. The great hall smelled of ale and smoke and wet wool. In the gallery above, a few musicians played softly. Laughter echoed from the high tables, where Sir Kirby Pym and Sir Lucas Nayland were playing a drinking game. Up on the dais, Lord Peak was speaking earnestly with Lord Costain, while Ambrose Butterwell's new bride sat abandoned in her high seat. Down below the salt, Dunk found Sir Kyle drowning his woes in Lord Butterwell's ale. His trencher was filled with a thick stew made with food left over from the night before. A bowl of brown, they called such fare in the pot shops of King's Landing. Sir Kyle had plainly had no stomach for it. Untouched, the stew had grown cold, and a film of grease glistened atop the brown. Dunk slipped onto the bench beside him. Sir Kyle. The cat nodded. Sir Duncan, will you have some ale? No. Ale was the last thing that he needed. Are you unwell, sir? Forgive me, but you look better than I feel. What was done with Glendon Ball? They took him to the dungeons, 
Sir Kyle shook his head. Whores get or no, the boy never struck me as a thief. He isn't. Sir Kyle squinted at him. Your arm. How did... A dagger. Dunk turned to face the dais, frowning. He had escaped death twice today. That would suffice for most men, he knew. Dunk the lunk, thick as a castle wall. He pushed to his feet. Your grace, he called. A few men on nearby benches put down their spoons, broke off their conversations, and turned to look at him. Your grace, Dunk said again more loudly. He strode up the mirish carpet toward the dais. Damon! Now half the hall grew quiet. At the high table, the man who'd called himself the Fiddler turned to smile at him. He had donned a purple tunic for the feast, Dunk saw. Purple to bring out the color of his eyes. Sir Duncan, I am pleased that you are with us. What would you have of me? Justice, said Dunk, for Glendon Ball. The name echoed off the walls, and for half a heartbeat, it was as if every man, woman, and boy in the hall had turned to stone. Then Lord Costain slammed a fist upon a table and shouted, It's death that one deserves, not justice! A dozen other voices echoed his, and Sir Harbert Page declared, He's bastard born! All bastards are thieves or worse! Blood will tell! For a moment, Dunk despaired. I am alone here. But then Sir Kyle the Cat pushed himself to his feet, swaying only slightly. The boy may be a bastard, my lords, but he's Fireball's bastard. It's like Sir Harbert said, blood will tell. Damon frowned. No one honors Fireball more than I do, he said. I will not believe this false knight is his seed. He stole the dragon's egg and slew three good men in the doing. He stole nothing and killed no one, Dunk insisted. If three men were slain, look elsewhere for their killer. Your grace knows as well as I that Sir Glendon was in the yard all day, riding one tilt after the other. Aye, Damon admitted. I wondered at that myself. But the dragon's egg was found amongst his things. Was it? Where is it now? Lord Gorman Peak rose, cold-eyed and imperious. Safe and well-guarded. And why is that any concern of yours, sir? Bring it forth, said Dunk. I'd like another look at it, my lord. The other night I saw it only for a moment. Peak's eyes narrowed. Your grace, he said to Damon. It comes to me that this hedge knight arrived at White Walls with Sir Glendon, uninvited. He may well be part of this. Dunk ignored that. Your grace, the dragon's egg that Lord Peak found amongst Sir Glendon's things was the one he placed there. Let him bring it forth if he can. Examine it yourself. I'll wager you it's no more than a painted stone. The hall erupted into chaos. A hundred voices began to speak at once, and a dozen knights leapt to their feet. Damon looked near as young and lost as Sir Glendon had when he had been accused. Are you drunk, my friend? Would that I were. I've lost some blood, Dunk allowed, but not my wits. Sir Glendon has been wrongfully accused. Why? Damon demanded, baffled. If Ball did no wrong, as you insist, why would his lordship say he did and try to prove it with some painted rock? to remove him from your path. His lordship bought your other foes with gold and promises, but Ball was not for sale. The fiddler flushed. That is not true. It is true. Send for Sir Glendon and ask him yourself. I will do just that. Lord Peak, have the bastard fetched up at once, and bring the dragon's egg as well. I wish to have a closer look at it. Gorman Peak gave Dunk a look of loathing. Your Grace, the bastard boy is being questioned. A few more hours and we will have a confession for you, I do not doubt. By question, my lord means tortured, said Dunk, 
A few more hours and Sir Glendon will confess to having killed your grace's father and both your brothers, too. Enough! Lord Peak's face was almost purple. One more word and I will rip your tongue out by the roots. You lie, said Dunk. That's two words. And you will rue the both of them, Peak promised. Take this man and chain him in the dungeons. No. Damon's voice was dangerously quiet. I want the truth of this. Sunderland, Virwell, Smallwood, take your men and go find Sir Glendon in the dungeons. Bring him up forthwith and see that no harm comes to him. If any man should try to hinder you, tell him you are about the king's business. As you command, Lord Virwell answered. I will settle this as my father would, the fiddler said. Sir Glendon stands accused of grievous crimes. As a knight, he has a right to defend himself by strength of arms. I shall meet him in the lists, and let the gods determine guilt and innocence. Hero's blood or whore's blood, Dunk thought when two of Lord Virwell's men dumped Sir Glendon naked at his feet. He has a deal less of it than he did before. The boy had been savagely beaten. His face was bruised and swollen. Several of his teeth were cracked or missing. His right eye was weeping blood, and up and down his chest, his flesh was red and cracking where they'd burned him with hot irons. You're safe now, murmured Sir Kyle. There's no one here but hedge knights, and the gods know that we're a harmless lot. Damon had given them the maester's chambers, and commanded them to dress any hurts Sir Glendon might have suffered and see that he was ready for the lists. Three fingernails had been pulled from Ball's left hand, Dunk saw, as he washed the blood from the boy's face and hands. That worried him more than all the rest. Can you hold a lance? A lance? Blood and spit dribbled from Sir Glendon's mouth when he tried to speak. Do I have all my fingers? Ten said Dunk, but only seven fingernails. Ball nodded. Black Tom was going to cut my fingers off, but he was called away. Is it him that I'm to fight? No, I killed him. That made him smile. Someone had to. You're to tilt against the fiddler, but his real name is Damon. I, they told me. The Black Dragon. Sir Glendon laughed. My father died for him. I would have been his man and gladly. I would have fought for him, killed for him, died for him. But I could not lose for him. He turned his head and spat out a broken tooth. Could I have a cup of wine? Sir Kyle, get the wineskin. The boy drank long and deep, then wiped his mouth. Look at me. I'm shaking like a girl. Dunk frowned. Can you still sit a horse? Help me wash and bring me my shield and lance and saddle, Sir Glendon said, and you will see what I can do. It was almost dawn before the rain let up enough for the combat to take place. The castle yard was a morass of soft mud glistening wetly by the light of a hundred torches. Beyond the field, a gray mist was rising, sending ghostly fingers up the pale stone walls to grasp the castle battlements. Many of the wedding guests had vanished during the intervening hours, but those who remained climbed the viewing stand again and settled themselves on planks of rain-soaked pine. Amongst them stood Sir Gorman Peak, surrounded by a knot of lesser lords and household knights. It had been only a few years since Dunk had squired for old Sir Arlen. He had not forgotten how. He cinched the buckles on Sir Glendon's ill-fitting armor, fastened his helm to his gorget, helped him mount, and handed him his shield. Earlier contests had left deep gouges in the wood, but the blazing fireball could still be seen. He looks as young as egg, Dunk thought, a frightened boy and grim. His sorrel mare was unbarded and skittish as well. He should have stayed with his own mount. 
The sorrel may be better bred and swifter, but a rider rides best on a horse that he knows well, and this one is a stranger to him. I'll need a lance, Sir Glendon said, a war lance. Dunk went to the racks. War lances were shorter and heavier than the tourney lances that had been used in all the earlier tilts. Eight feet of solid ash, ending in an iron point. Dunk chose one and pulled it out, running his hand along its length to make sure it had no cracks. At the far end of the lists, one of Damon's squires was offering him a matching lance. He was a fiddler no more. In place of swords and fiddles, the trapping of his war horse now displayed the three-headed dragon of House Blackfire, black on a field of red. The prince had washed the black dye from his hair as well, so it flowed down to his collar in a cascade of silver and gold that glimmered like beaten metal in the torchlight. Egg would have hair like that if he ever let it grow, Dunk realized. He found it hard to picture him that way, but one day he knew he must, if the two of them should live so long. The herald climbed his platform once again. Sir Glendon, the bastard, stands accused of theft and murder, he proclaimed, and now comes forth to prove his innocence at the hazard of his body. Damon of House Blackfire, the second of his name, right-born king of the Andals and the Roymar and the First Men, lord of the Seven Kingdoms and protector of the realm, comes forth to prove the truth of the accusations against the bastard Glendon. And all at once the years fell away, and Dunk was back at Ashford Meadow once again, listening to Baylor Breakspear just before they went forth to battle for his life. He slipped the war lance back in place, plucked a tourney lance from the next rack, twelve feet long, slender, elegant. Use this he told Sir Glendon. It's what we used at Ashford at the Trial of Seven. The fiddler chose a war lance. He means to kill me. First he has to strike you. If your aim is true, his point will never touch you. I don't know. I do. Sir Glendon snatched the lance from him, wheeled about, and trotted toward the lists. Seven save us both, then. Somewhere in the east, lightning cracked across a pale pink sky. Damon raked his stallion's side with golden spurs and leapt forward like a thunderclap, lowering his war lance with its deadly iron point. Sir Glendon raised his shield and raced to meet him, swinging his own longer lance across his mare's head to bear upon the young pretender's chest. Mud sprayed back from their horses' hooves, and the torches seemed to burn the brighter as the two knights went pounding past. Dunk closed his eyes. He heard a crack, a shout, a thump. No! He heard Lord Peak cry out in anguish. No! For half a heartbeat, Dunk almost felt sorry for him. He opened his eyes again. Riderless, the big black stallion was slowing to a trot. Dunk jumped out and grabbed him by the reins. At the far end of the lists, Sir Glendon Ball wheeled his mare and raised his splintered lance. Men rushed onto the field to where the fiddler lay unmoving, face down in a puddle. When they helped him to his feet, he was mud from head to heel. The brown dragon! Someone shouted. Laughter rippled through the yard as the dawn washed over white walls. It was only a few heartbeats later as Dunk and Sir Kyle were helping Glendon Ball off his horse, that the first trumpet blew, and the sentries on the walls raised the alarum. An army had appeared outside the castle, rising from the morning mists. Egg wasn't lying after all, Dunk told Sir Kyle, astonished. From Maidenpool had come Lord Mooton. From Raventree, Lord Blackwood. From Duskendale, Lord Darkland. The royal domains about King's Landing sent forth Hayfords, Rossbys, Stokeworths, Masseys, and the King's own sworn swords, led by three knights of the King's Guard and stiffened by three hundred raven's teeth with tall white weirwood bows. 
Mad Danielle Lothston herself rode forth in strength from her haunted towers at Harrenhal, clad in black armor that fit her like an iron glove, her long red hair streaming. The light of the rising sun glittered off the points of five hundred lances and ten times as many spears. The knight's gray banners were reborn in half a hundred gaudy colors, and above them all flew two regal dragons on night-black fields, the great three-headed beast of King Ares I, Targaryen, red as fire, and a white-winged fury breathing scarlet flame. Not Makar, after all, Dunk knew when he saw those banners. The banners of the Prince of Summerhall showed four three-headed dragons, two and two, the arms of the fourth-born son of the late King Daeron II, Targaryen. A single white dragon announced the presence of the King's Hand, Lord Brynden Rivers. Bloodraven himself had come to White Wall. The first Blackfire Rebellion had perished on the red grass field in blood and glory. The second Blackfire Rebellion ended with a whimper. They cannot cow us, young Damon proclaimed from the castle battlements after he had seen the ring of iron that encircled them. For our cause is just. We'll slash through them and ride hell-bent for King's Landing. Sound the trumpets. Instead... Knights and lords and men-at-arms muttered quietly to one another, and a few began to slink away, making for the stables or a postern gate, or some hidey hole they hoped might keep them safe. And when Damon drew his sword and raised it above his head, every man of them could see it was not Blackfire. We'll make another red grass field today, the pretender promised. Piss on that, fiddle boy! A grizzled squire shouted back at him, I'd sooner live. In the end, the second Damon Blackfire rode forth alone, reined up before the royal host, and challenged Lord Bloodraven to single combat. I will fight you, or the coward Ares, or any champion you care to name. Instead, Lord Bloodraven's men surrounded him, pulled him off his horse, and clasped him into golden fetters. The banner he had carried was planted in the muddy ground and set afire. It burned for a long time, sending up a twisted plume of smoke that could be seen for leagues around. The only blood that was shed that day came when a man in service to Lord Virwell began to boast that he had been one of Bloodraven's eyes and would soon be well rewarded. By the time the moon turns, I'll be fucking whores and drinking Dornish red he was purported to have said, just before one of Lord Costain's knights slit his throat. Drink that, he said as Verwell's man drowned in his own blood. That's not Dornish, but it's red. Elsewise, it was a sullen, silent column that trudged through the gates of White Walls to toss their weapons into a glittering pile before being bound and led away to await Lord Bloodraven's judgment. Dunk emerged with the rest of them, together with Sir Kyle the Cat and Glendon Ball. They had looked for Sir Maynard to join them, but Plum had melted away sometime during the night. It was late that afternoon before Sir Roland Crakehall of the Kingsguard found Dunk among the other prisoners. Sir Duncan, where in seven hells have you been hiding? Lord Rivers has been asking for you for hours. Come with me, if you please. Dunk fell in beside him. Crake Hall's long cloak flapped behind him with every gust of wind, as white as moonlight on snow. The sight of it made him think back to the words the fiddler had spoken up on the roof. I dreamed that you were all in white from head to heel, with a long pale cloak flowing from those broad shoulders. Dunk snorted. Aye, and you dreamed of dragons hatching from stone eggs. One is likely as to other. The hand's pavilion was half a mile from the castle, in the shade of a spreading elm tree. A dozen cows were cropping at the grass nearby. Kings rise and fall, Dunk thought, and cows and small folk go about their business. It was something the old man used to say. What will become of all of them? He asked Sir Roland as they passed a group of captives sitting on the grass. 
they'll be marched back to King's Landing for a trial. The knights and men-at-arms should get off light enough. They were only following their liege lords. And the lords? Some will be pardoned, so long as they tell the truth of what they know and give up a son or daughter to vouchsafe their future loyalty. It will go harder for those who took pardons after the red grass field. They'll be imprisoned or attainted. The worst will lose their heads. Bloodraven had made a start on that already, Dunk saw when they came up on his pavilion. Flanking the entrance, the severed heads of Gorman Peak and Black Tom Heddle had been impaled on spears, with their shields displayed beneath them. Three castles, black on orange, the man who slew Roger of Pennytree. Even in death, Lord Gorman's eyes were hard and flinty. Dunk closed them with his fingers. What did you do that for? asked one of the guardsmen. The crows'll have them soon enough. I owed him that much. If Roger had not died that day, the old man would never have looked twice at Dunk when he saw him chasing that pig through the alleys of King's Landing. Some old dead king gave a sword to one son instead of another. That was the start of it. And now I'm standing here, and poor Roger's in his grave. The hand awaits, commanded Roland Craighall. Dunk stepped past him into the presence of Lord Brynden Rivers, bastard, sorcerer, and hand of the king. Egg stood before him, freshly bathed and garbed in princely raiment, as would befit a nephew of the king. Nearby, Lord Frey was seated in a camp chair with a cup of wine to hand and his hideous little heir squirming in his lap. Lord Butterwell was there as well, on his knees, pale-faced and shaking. Treason is no less vile because the traitor proves a craven, Lord Rivers was saying. I have heard your bleatings, Lord Ambrose, and I believe one word in ten. On that account, I will allow you to retain a tenth part of your fortune. You may keep your wife as well. I wish you joy of her. And white walls? asked Butterwell with quavering voice. Forfeit to the Iron Throne. I mean to pull it down stone by stone and sow the ground that it stands upon with salt. In twenty years, no one will remember it existed. Old fools and young malcontents still make pilgrimages to the red grass field to plant flowers on the spot where Damon Blackfire fell. I will not suffer white walls to become another monument to the black dragon. He waved a pale hand. Now scurry away, roach. The hand is kind. Butterwell stumbled off, so blind with grief that he did not even seem to recognize Dunk as he passed. You have my leave to go as well, Lord Frey, Rivers commanded. We will speak again later. As my lord commands. Frey led his son from the pavilion. Only then did the king's hand turn to Dunk. He was older than Dunk remembered him, with a lined, hard face, but his skin was still as pale as bone, and his cheek and neck still bore the ugly, wine-stained birthmark that some people thought looked like a raven. His boots were black, his tunic scarlet. Over it he wore a cloak the color of smoke, fastened with a brooch in the shape of an iron hand. His hair fell to his shoulders, long and white and straight, brushed forward so as to conceal his missing eye, the one that Bittersteel had plucked from him on the red grass field. The eye that remained was very red, how many eyes has Bloodraven? A thousand eyes and one. No doubt Prince Makar had some good reason for allowing his son to squire for a hedge knight, he said, though I cannot imagine it included delivering him to a castle full of traitors plotting rebellion. How is it that I come to find my cousin in this nest of adders, sir? Lord Butterbutt would have me believe that Prince Makar sent you here to sniff out this rebellion in the guise of a mystery knight. Is that the truth of it? Dunk went to one knee. No, my lord. I mean, yes, my lord. That's what Aeg told him. Aegon, I mean, 
Prince Aegon. So that part's true. It isn't what you'd call the true truth, though. I see. So the two of you learned of this conspiracy against the crown and decided you would thwart it by yourselves, is that the way of it? That's not it either. We just sort of blundered into it, I suppose you'd say. Egg crossed his arms. And Sir Duncan and I had matters well in hand before you turned up with your army. We had some help, my lord, Dunk added. Hedge knights. Aye, my lord. Sir Kyle the Cat and Maynard Plum and Sir Glendon Ball. It was him unhorsed the fit, the pretender. Yes, I've heard that tale from half a hundred lips already. The bastard of the pussy willows, born of a whore and a traitor. Born of heroes, Egg insisted. If he's among the captives, I want him found and released, and rewarded. And who are you to tell the king's hand what to do? Egg did not flinch. You know who I am, cousin. Your squire is insolent, sir, Lord Rivers said to Dunk. You ought to beat that out of him. I've tried, my lord. He's a prince, though. What he is, said Bloodraven, is a dragon. Rise, sir. Dunk rose. There have always been Targaryens who dreamed of things to come since long before the conquest, Bloodraven said, so we should not be surprised if from time to time a blackfire displays the gift as well. Damon dreamed that a dragon would be born at White Walls, and it was. The fool just got the color wrong. Dunk looked at Egg. The ring, he saw. His father's ring. It's on his finger, not stuffed up inside his boot. I have half a mind to take you back to King's Landing with us, Lord Rivers said to Egg, and keep you at my court as my... guest. My father would not take kindly to that. I suppose not. Prince Makar has a prickly nature. Perhaps I should send you back to Summer Hall. My place is with Sir Duncan. I'm his squire. Seven save you both. As you wish, you're free to go. We will, said Egg, but first we need some gold. Sir Duncan needs to pay the snail his ransom. Bloodraven laughed. What happened to the modest boy I once met at King's Landing? As you say, my prince, I will instruct my paymaster to give you as much gold as you wish, within reason. Only as a loan, insisted Dunk, I'll pay it back. When you learn to joust, no doubt. Lord Rivers flicked them away with his fingers unrolled a parchment, and began to tick off names with a quill. He is marking down the men to die, Dunk realized. My lord, he said, we saw the heads outside. Is that... Will the fiddler, Damon, will you have his head as well? Lord Bloodraven looked up from his parchment. That is for King Ares to decide. But Damon has four younger brothers and sisters as well. Should I be so foolish as to remove his pretty head, his mother will mourn, his friends will curse me for a kinslayer, and Bittersteel will crown his brother Hagon. Dead, young Damon is a hero. Alive, he is an obstacle in my half-brother's path. He can hardly make a third Blackfire king whilst the second remains so inconveniently alive. Besides... Such a noble captive will be an ornament to our court, and a living testament to the mercy and benevolence of his grace, King Ares. I have a question, too, said Egg. I begin to understand why your father was so willing to be rid of you. What more would you have of me, cousin? Who took the dragon's egg? There were guards at the door and more guards on the steps. No way anyone could have gotten into Lord Butterwell's bedchamber unobserved. Lord Rivers smiled. Were I to guess, I'd say someone climbed up inside the privy shaft. The privy shaft was too small to climb. For a man, a 
child could do it. Or a dwarf, Dunk blurted. A thousand eyes and one. Why shouldn't some of them belong to a troop of comic dwarfs? <laughs> <laughs>